right, good evening, board members. It's 6 o'clock, and so it's time to start. We do have a quorum, so we call this meeting to order. Ms. Allward, if you would offer our invocation for us tonight. Dear Lord, we ask that you guide us as we make decisions tonight and in the future on behalf of our students, our teachers, our staff, and the administrative team of Granville County Public Schools. Be with our parents and families of our students, as well as the leaders of our communities, as we all work together to provide safe, nurturing environments for our children to learn and to succeed. Bless every hand that plays a part in their education as they learn to become educated and productive citizens of Granville County. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, Mr. Udy, if you'll lead us on our pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight we do have a special part of our meeting before we start. We have a swearing in for a new board member. And so I'd like to ask the superintendent if you'll join me at the podium with Senator Mike Woodard, Dr. and Mrs. McKnight, if you'll join us as well. Good. Gregory McKnight, I, Gregory McKnight, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support and maintain, that I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States, the Constitution and laws of the United States, and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina, and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith, not inconsistent therewith, and that I will faithfully discharge, and I will faithfully discharge the duties of my office. As a member of the Granville County Board of Education. As a member of the Granville County Board of Education. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Board members, we will now move on to our next item of business. You have the approval of minutes. You have four sets of minutes before you tonight. January 2nd, special meeting. January 6th, our regular board meeting. January 15th, our special meeting that was a workshop. And January 28th, there was a phone conference uh, meeting. And so when you are ready, we will take action on those. If you have any corrections or if you'd like to make a motion to approve. I make a motion to approve as presented. Okay. Second. I have a motion by Dr. Houlihan and a second by Mr. Udy. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Aye. All those opposed? All right. Madam Superintendent, are there any changes to our agenda tonight? No, Mr. Chair, none this evening. All right. Board members, you have one item in front of you for consent. Uh, field trips, you saw that on board docs. Uh, if you do not have any questions, then we will proceed with taking a motion to approve those uh, or any other action you wish to take. I make a motion that we approve the field trip. Right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? A right, motion by Mr. Udy and a second by Ms. Allred. Any further discussion? All, right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. So, board members, if you'll join us at the red carpet, we have some special recognitions tonight. to Miss Teresa Baker, our <coughs> recycling coordinator for Granville County Public Schools. <laughs> We're proud to announce that Miss Baker this year has received the Women Who Make a Difference Award sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Granville County. An award luncheon and ceremony will take place on Saturday, March 14th, 2020 at the Oxford United Methodist Church here in Oxford from 12 noon until 2 p.m. And the keynote speaker is the Honorable Anita Earls, Associate Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. We are so proud of you, Teresa. You truly are a woman who makes a difference. Let's give Ms. Baker another round of applause. That concludes our recognitions for this evening. Thank you all.
this time we are at our public comment time, and according to Dr. Winborn, we have no one signed up. All right, so we will move along. Dr. McLean, if you'll give us a report for the superintendent. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Mr. Chair, our board members, guests, and friends. Since we last met, a great deal has occurred in the district, and I'm thrilled to share highlights this evening. I will begin by welcoming our newest board member. It's exciting to have a full compliment sitting around the table tonight, so welcome, Dr. McKnight. We're also excited to have a Social Worker Appreciation Week, and we're thrilled to be able to celebrate our social workers this week. And I cannot let this moment pass without giving kudos one more time to Miss Cat, as she's affectionately called, our state wrestling champion. She made history, uh, and, and she certainly deserves kudos this evening. We're really excited about that. Our pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, and choice registrations are still open, so please get your young people registered for school right away. Feel free to visit our website for more specific information. We would love to have your youngsters. Granville County Public Schools is the very best educational option for children in our community. Our district embraces diversity and equity for all students and their cultures in our district. February allowed us, however, to illuminate Black History Month and our schools had some incredible programs we hope you had an opportunity to enjoy. Speaking of such enjoyment, some of our younger students had a great deal of fun commemorating the 100th day of school. So join me in taking a look at the screen. These are some photos from the 100th day of school throughout the district. And somehow that little cutie in the middle was so amazing, she wanted everyone to know her daddy dressed her. <laughs> I thought that was so sweet. And then that little one with those hair rollers in her hair is a first grader in my family, and she sent that to me and said she was dressed like Aunt Lisa. I don't know if I'm happy or sad. <laughs> but they all had fun throughout our district and honestly across the state. Look at these babies. The 100th day of school was special. Not only did they dress and give homage to those who they thought were 100. My mother said, well, if she thinks you're 100, how old am I? <laughs> I thought, Mama, let's not play that game. <laughs> yeah. They had fun, but they had fun activities, too. They had a lot of fun activities and were always on the move, having great times with our children. A few weeks back, I'm pleased to announce that we held our Winter 2020 Kitchen Table Conversation with school administrators, school improvement team members, students, teachers, parents, PTA members, law enforcement, business partners, school board members, district leaders, and leaders in schools. It was a powerful evening of listening and garnering feedback on our strategic plan. Calendar options, budget, my future NC, safety in our schools, and more. The feedback was greatly appreciated and will be shared over the course of the next few months. Last week, our 11th graders participated in the yearly ACT, for which they have prepared this year, and academic preparations are continuing to be a focus across the district. Athletics, however, has also <laughs> risen to the top this season as we've experienced some, make some amazing firsts that were wonderful to see in winter sports. Granville County Public Schools has some well-rounded, well-equipped students. Right now, I'm pleased to announce we still have two basketball teams in state playoffs, and I hope the community will come out to support South Granville playing here at home and support Granville Central as they travel away. Both teams are doing quite well in their seasons. Please note the 2020 Teacher Working Conditions Survey opened today. So all of our teachers listening, don't forget to go online and take your Teacher Working Conditions Survey. Our Spelling Bee and Celebration events are right around the corner. They will take place next week. 
Our board even has a team, and we're pleased that Farrington and Smith is sponsoring our Board of Education team. We thank everyone for their participation in advance, and we're asking everyone to come out and support the Grand Ballet Foundation. Finally, I'm excited about our district's very first Direction of Public Education event we are holding with partners in the community on the 23rd of this month. This will be a collaborative meeting with commissioners and Vance Granville Community College, also with our um, also with our partners, Duke Energy, and others in the community. Board members, you have a flyer on this in your folder this evening, and I ask you to pull that to make certain you have this marked on your calendar. We then have a commissioner partnership meeting on the 30th of the month. We are most definitely on the move in new and exciting ways. Board members, take a look at your dates to remember section this evening at the end of your agenda tonight, and you will find two dates to travel with me for this upcoming set of instructional walks. The best way for you to measure what is occurring in our schools is to visit and to see firsthand. So please try to join me on these trips. Remember, although there are some incredible initiatives taking place all over the district, the workaround performance remains our top priority. Now I hope everyone is heeding to the guidance provided around keeping staff and students safe from cold and flu season and from the coronavirus epidemic that has crept into the country. We're offering recommendations very similar to proper hand washing, coughing in one's elbow, and staying home if sick. For these are just a few of the ways we can all stay safe. Our district will continue providing messaging and updated information from the CDC, the Health Department, Granville Health System, and other health partners. Our goal is to stay ready so we won't have to get ready. This concludes my report this evening. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Board, I'd like to update you on a couple of items. <clears throat> I'd like to add my congratulations to Dr. McKnight. I look forward to working with you and seeing what you have to offer this board to continue Granville County to move forward. There's been much going on in the district since our last board meeting, so we so much so we've had to fill an extra day with a leap year. <laughs> we saw students celebrate Black History Month with some exciting learning opportunities from biographies, wax museums, special presentations, and even a Motown concert where I was able to learn that our superintendent <laughs> would even get up and dance to encourage our students oh. to show us what they learned. It was a good night. Thank you. <laughs> it was also a privilege to see our two powerhouse student athlete teams from South Granville and Granville Central go head-to-head -head in a televised basketball game on Valentine's. What amazes me is I watch student athletes and get the opportunity to meet ones like Kat Pendergrass is that they are moving us forward as athletes but also as students who have certain academic requirements to participate that they must meet. They are examples of what we're attempting to grow performance in all areas. So congratulations to those who are achieving excellence in athletics as well. I hope each of you will seek out opportunities to support our students and staff by participating in various academic, athletic, and fine arts programs that we have across the district. This past month, I had the opportunity to attend the public forum of North Carolina's Eggs and Issues event at NC State. You've received a packet of information that highlights the forum's top issues in education, as well as annual finance study for public education. I would encourage you to take time to read through this material. Each of these issues affect us here in Granville County. As a result of this event and the information, we will host, as Dr. McLean has said, an education in North Carolina night right here in our boardroom. The event will host our local commissioners and local business leaders and border and districts as we seek to collaborate on seeking answers to those opportunities to further education here in North Carolina and Granville County. As you requested, we met with our liaisons for the Granville County Board of Commissioners last Monday. Ms. Day presented our adopted budget resolution to them, and we discussed continuing work surrounding restructuring here in Granville County Public Schools. 
Dr. Winborn outlined the steps that the board has taken over the last couple of years to restructure our infrastructure footprint, including the presentation that we received from Holly Middle School last month. At the end of this month, on March 30th, as Dr. McLean has said, we will have a joint session with those county commissioners at Thornton Library to learn the steps the district has taken and then have some dialogue about some appropriate next steps in the way of that infrastructure. On March 16th, we will have our work session here at Central Office, and at this meeting, we will take up three topics. We will focus on finalizing our board training schedule for the rest of the year. We will also finalize our new board procedures that you received a draft from last month. We will finish tonight with our mid-year superintendent evaluation conversation. You received a memo from me last week regarding that work and how to come best prepared. I realize that March is full with a lot of board work, but I thank you for di your diligence as we seek to continue to move the performance needle in Granville County Public Schools. Board members, do you have reports? Ms. Judy? This month I was able to attend two of the meetings. Uh, one was a liaison with the county commissioners. Um, the one thing that David left out is their biggest concern on where we are is how we got there. It seems like no one understands the steps we've done and what actually put us in this predicament to have to deal with the schools. So that's one of the things that will be presented at the next meeting at the Thornton Library on the 30th. Uh, the other one was uh, the Security Safety S Committee. Um, our biggest two topics was about the coronavirus and that the nurses here in Granville County, they have a plan and they'll be implementing it. Um, it's the same one as we used for the flu. So it's not going to be anything changed. <coughs> um, and the other one was on the drug and alcohol. That was a big topic. Um, we're still trying to find out. We know what they've been doing in the schools, but we're trying to find out what the SROs are doing and they wanted to add vapor vaporing to uh, the policy. And they were also discussing the disciplinary actions for vaporing. Okay. Anything else? That's all. Mr. Rivers? Yeah, in the past month, um, <coughs> as part of uh, my interest in trying to understand if we can find ways to have more cooperative work with our local charter schools, I visited uh, Falls Lake Academy and Oxford Prep, and I spoke to Dr. Mathis, and I'll be visiting uh, Vance Charter in a couple of weeks. Um, the, uh, and the reason for this is, is several. Is, is, there's several reasons. One, I've heard at meetings at this board and from others across the state that uh, who, who probably are not as open towards the charter schools um, as some, that um, the charter schools are sort of a modern form of segregation. And that certainly concerned me because I, I don't want to have anything, any part of anything like that. So I figured the best thing to do was actually visit the schools and get data and see what I found out. Uh, it turns out that the data does not support that view. In fact, it's just the opposite. And I found some surprising uh, information. The most recent DPI data that I could get from their website, and this, this I think will surprise most of you, shows that a higher percentage of African-American students attend North Carolina charter schools than attend North Carolina traditional public schools. Let me repeat that. A higher percentage of the students attending North Carolina charter schools are African-American than those attending North Carolina traditional public schools. It's close, but 26.3% of the charter school students are African-American in the state of North Carolina 25.7% of the traditional public school students are African American. The looking at Granville County, and we want to see uh, you know, how we compare. The last data I saw in the fall, and I I have uh, been trying to get the demographic data for Granville County and have not gotten it yet, showed that about 30% of our students today in Granville County schools are African American. However, the percentage of African American students at the four local charter schools, two in Granville County, two in, in Vance County. Um, that their percentage of African-American students is 33%. Therefore, a higher percentage of our local African-American students attend charter schools than attend Granville County schools. And here's a demographic breakdown of the local charter schools by percentage of subgroup. 
Falls Lake Academy is 75% white, 11% African American, 6% Hispanic, and 8% other. Their others include Asian Americans, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders. Uh, their, their total minority percentage is 25%. Oxford Prep is 76% white, 11% African American, 6% Hispanic, and 7% other for a total minority participation of 24%. Henderson Collegiate is 5% white, 80% African American, 15% Hispanic, for a total minority percentage of 95%. And Vance Charter is 81% white, 9% African American, 4% Hispanic, 6% other for a total minority uh, uh, percentage of 19%. So let's compare that to some of our schools. Granville Early College High School, which is an A-rated school and, and is, is, is a powerhouse uh, high school, at, at uh, Granville Early College, 16% of the students are African American. At Mount Energy Elementary School, 68% are white, 14% African American, 18% Hispanic, for a total minority participation of 32%. Tar River has a white population of 75%, an African American population of 11%, and 12% Hispanic population, for a total minority percentage of 23%. Uh, Wilton is similarly 66% white, 19% African American, 15% Hispanic, for 34% minority participation. And Hawley is 60% white, 25% African American, 14% Hispanic, for 39% minority participation. So the, the, the two Granville County charter schools are not far out of bounds compared to some of our schools. Now clearly, in the north part of the county where our, our demographics are different, we have much higher percentages of African American students. But in the southern part of the county, those percentages compare to the charter school percentages. Now, it should be noted that each charter school freely uh, gave me their demographic information. I called them on the phone. Three of the four gave it to me over the phone, and one of them said they'd email it to me. I got it the very next day. Uh, I've asked for our demographic, demographic information over two months ago, almost two months ago, and still have not received it. So what I had to do was go through uh, Ms. Cook's um, subgroup uh, performance data, which had the actual raw numbers, the actual numbers of African American, <coughs> Hispanic, white students, and calculate the percentages uh, from that method. Um, so I, I believe my figures are fairly close, but I was not able to obtain from Granville County Schools as a school board member. I've still not been able to obtain our demographic data. The charter schools have no control over who they accept anymore. All of the charter schools are at capacity, with the exception of Oxford Prep, which is beginning their uh, K through five program next year. So we will see um, probably a, a larger influx of students and in, in, in exodus of our students as they fill their K through five slots. But after that, all the schools are at capacity. And I talked to them and they all, um, well, basically this is kind of interesting. Each year, the um, three, and I didn't talk to Henderson Collegiate about this. Is they're, a, they're a different situation because they have in their charter provisions that allow them to disproportionately uh, accept African American students and that's why their demographics are so lopsided towards African Americans so um, that's that's not how most of the charter schools operate but for the three other charter schools <coughs> they all have to do or they all do by state law blind lotteries blind drawings all three uh, submit their applications unseen to a third party, an independent third party, and there's a blind lottery. Now, the, those three charter schools receive about 1,500 applications per year, and they can take in, the three of them, about 190. Now, again, Oxford Prep will be different next year because they're bringing in five grades. But, but after that, each one of them uh, takes in, Oxford Prep takes in about 70 a year, Falls Lake Academy takes in about uh, 110 a year, and um, uh, Vance Charter takes in about 75 to 80 a year. So it's a complete blind lottery. The percentages and the minority participation, I believe, in all these three local schools will increase because all three are heavily into recruiting minority participation. However, it's a blind lottery. So unless <coughs> more minorities submit applications, which they're doing every year, and the minority numbers are increasing, 
Um, but it's, it's completely, in fact, on the applications, you cannot specify what ethnicity you are. So it's a, t a total blind uh, drawing. Um, the uh, Vance Charter has the lowest percentage of uh, minority participation, but it's a very interesting situation. Henderson Collegiate has an overwhelming minority participation. Uh, Vance Charter is trying to recruit uh, African American students um, while Henderson Collegiate has established themselves uh, as being a, a, um, a strong uh, African American school. So it's interesting, Dr. Mathis told me today that they have been meeting, Henderson Collegiate and Vance Charter are meeting, and among the things they're discussing is how they can get these demographics a little bit more in line. In, in other words, uh, get more white participation in Henderson Collegiate, get more African American participation uh, at Vance Charter. So I think we're going to see as the years go by uh, some change there because both of those schools are, are kind of, as Dr. Mathis said, fairly lopsided. Um, let's see. Uh, it should be noted that uh, Falls Lake Academy, Oxford Prep, Henderson Collegiate, and Vance Charter, and this surprised me, all have Lar fairly large EC populations, and I didn't know that they even had EC populations. Um, Vance Charter, for example, has 75 exceptional children. That's 8% of their student body. Um, and uh, that was something that, that did surprise me. All three, all four schools have uh, EC programs. Henderson Collegiate has buses and a cafeteria. Um, Oxford Prep is trying to acquire buses, and, and uh, Vance Charter is as well. The, Buses will probably um, also perhaps change the demographic somewhat. Um, as far as the cafeterias, it's fascinating. Uh, at Falls Lake Academy, they use the lunch period time for individualized instruction. So in other words, the children eat in the classroom, and they go to a certain classroom, their homeroom classroom. And children that are identified that are struggling in a certain area typically will receive counseling during that lunch period uh, and they also have after school tutoring, but it's it's part of their evaluations occur during that that lunch time. Um, the uh, Oxford Prep, on the other hand, has local food establishments come to the school and for reduced price provide pizzas, for instance, or or hamburgers, that type of stuff. And all the schools do provide um, accommodations for students who who may uh, um, may need help. Uh, Vance Charter told me, for instance, that 20% of their students qualify for free or reduced lunch. And so they are in that program, but the other students, the other schools, uh, assist those in need. And all schools told me that um, those children who who need transportation assistance, they try to work with them too. But the, the main key is their application pool, which, of which they have no control. Um, so basically, when I look at this, uh, with the fact that in the state of North Carolina, a larger percentage of African Americans attend charter schools, and when I look at, at our percentages with Falls Lake Academy and Oxford Prep, which is really the schools I care about, because those are the schools that we might be able to do some cooperative work with, um, you know, I, I did not see any indication, and I actually saw, uh, if you look at um, – on the websites of their staffs, you know their staffs are, are, are very diverse. So I was, I was uh, pleased with that. So, from my perspective, from having looked into this, uh, I do not believe that um, that it can be said that that charter schools are in any way not trying to to be diverse uh, and are not diverse. Um, the percentages, you know, compare favorably to some of our schools, and the overall numbers, of course. There is a skew with Henderson Collegiate, but the fact of the matter is a higher percentage of African Americans attend charter schools than attend Granville County schools. So that's, that's, uh, that surprised me. Um, the matter at hand, many of you all may have seen the emails over the weekend. Um, I, would, I would like to see if the board has a sense for Dr. Dr. McLean's benefit of whether we want to try to start doing more cooperative work with our local charter schools, which, which I personally think is the right way to go. The, um, this college fair that Oxford Prep is offering, um, they currently, I was just told, have 28 schools participating. Um, the, it's, it's, it's a good time. It's something that I think that we could cooperate. We had the college fair, according to Dr. McLean, and I knew about this in, in, with Vance Granville Community College. But this is here, right here locally, very convenient to web. Um, 
where they're going to have a number of colleges for two hours in the same room at the same time. Um, I can see no downside to this. So what I would like to do is either offer a motion that, that we consider that the board, you know, ask the superintendent to informally, and this would be non-binding, but informally look at the feasibility of, of potentially ways where we could cooperate in areas like this, where we participate in a college fair, or some of their students participate in some extracurriculars that we have. Um, I think if we can use this to get the ball rolling, um, it, it's going to be good for everybody. Oxford Prep and Falls <coughs> Academy are established and successful. They're B-rated schools. Vance Charter is a B-rated school. Henderson Collegiate is an A-rated school. They are not going anywhere. They're going to be here. They've reached capacity. Um, so I think this is a chance, and this, this uh, college fair, I think, is an opportunity to start that. So, uh, Mr. Chair, um, I'd be willing to offer a motion that, that we, the board, um, consider looking into, non-binding, but just looking into the feasibility of whether we want to try to start uh, slowly working at more cooperative ways with our charter schools and let Dr. McLean come back to us uh, and say, this looks good or no, this is not a good idea. This is why we shouldn't do it. This is why we should. And, um, you know, you know, take her advice, let her make the decision, but at least ask, ask that she uh, look into how we might be able to work more cooperatively. Can you restate your motion succinctly so Mr. Penley? Sure, I will actually state the motion. The, the motion would be that we ask <coughs> the superintendent and her staff to informally uh, look at the feasibility of more cooperative work with our charter schools, beginning with this college fair recognizing it's the superintendent's call whether or not she thinks there is in, any viability <coughs> in this. But at least let's look at this and let's start, let's start the, um, start the uh, ball rolling. Okay. We heard the motion. Do we have a second before we move into discussion? Okay. So, so, so just, uh, Mr. Chair, I just, and I, I want the public to understand this. The county commissioners have made it clear they want us to cooperate with charter schools. Chamber of Commerce has made it clear. And I've, I have submitted a motion simply to look into it, not binding it whatsoever. Just look into it and see if there is any value or not. And there may be no value. And I can't get a second to just simply look in and see if we want to even consider it or if we want to even take advantage of this offer on this college fair. Give the board one more opportunity. Anybody want to second this motion? Okay. Seeing none, the motion fails. Right. Do you have anything else you want to add? No, I do. Thank you. Okay. Any other board members have reports? All right. Then we will move on. We have a presentation tonight by Miss Baker, who we honored just a little while ago, uh, on our recycle and sustainability program. to work with um, on the Bramble County Environmental Affairs Committee, Dr. David Hinton. He is a professor at the Duke School of Environment and is just superb in wanting to partner with Bramble County Schools, Bramble County to offer more opportunities to, to learn about our environment and what we can do to keep our environment clean. So some things I'd like to just put out to you all what we're doing um, on the horizon for Granville County Schools and Granville County. Um, we got a wonderful amount of donated furniture from um, a group in Durham and I was able to distribute that furniture to a lot of our uh, needed offices and throughout the school district and the county and also able to do so with schools that had extra desks, extra chairs, extra tables and then set up classrooms with um, different furniture items that they wanted to enhance their classrooms, just to give it a different look. Also, um, I get called on for my organizational skills to uh, go in and do some clean outs of classrooms that had been used for storage or um, 
we all have a junk drawer in our house, <laughs> that um, I'm able to go in and find uses for some of the items and sometimes not. Sometimes I have to find other pathways to dispose of them correctly. And we've made um, STEM labs, we've made maker spaces, science labs, um, we've turned them back into to usable um, classrooms and items. Um, so it's great to be able to find different pathways to recycle and or reuse um, as much as we can and to relocate. Also, a lot of times we get so caught up with just being able to be there and focus on the students and academics that there's nobody to be able to go in and say, okay, you've got 15 extra chairs, you've got 25 extra desks, and then you've got 35 extra chemistry books. Here they are in this room, here's a picture, and it's great to be able to do it, to go in and do that inventory and um, at all our schools to be able to share with the principals and the staff, this is what we've got and this is what we're, we're able to use. So working together to grow sustainable habits by example, and this is something that I really pride our staff, our child nutrition has worked with me since day one to uh, make sure that we are an example for North Carolina to show that our schools are using real reusable trays in our cafeterias as much as they possibly can to show the children that it's important. Life is not disposable. We've got to be able to use what resources we have, um, show the children that it's important, that we don't just throw everything away. So we are using reusable trays in all of our caf cafeterias that we possibly can. Also, um, we started using reusable utensils in um, most of all of our cafeterias that are possible as well. We're also taking extra efforts in um, one school in particular to be able to recycle our breakfast trays um, at Dark Containers in Randall in North Carolina. Um, we also make sure that we have recycling available in all of our cafeterias and available to be used at our athlete, athletic events and such. Um, having extra or unwanted safe foods available during lunchtime. Not every kid is as hungry as they are every single day. We have to treat them just like the human beings that we are. Not everybody um, wants a red apple or a green apple. So we're able to take that food, set it on a table in the cafeteria, and make it available during that lunchtime for them if they want an extra milk or they want an extra cup of strawberries. They're able to eat it because I know that I'm extra hungry some days and some days I just don't, I just don't want as much. Um, we're also able to save some of the packaged food and put it in our Backpack Buddies programs so that that food is not going to waste. <laughs> so I try to set myself some goals each year um, because it's important to stay on top of things and make sure that we each strive to do better and better. And I'd like to create a food waste diversion plan um, at select schools in our central office that we would basically have um, a food waste hauler to come and collect the food waste, take it to a commercial composting facility out of town. It would be turned into um, compost that could be utilized on our schools to help with our um, degraded soils to help with a lot of our issues with um, erosion, so that would be an awesome thing to have. Um, I'd also like to create a plan to, with options available for residents and restaurants to have curbside food waste diversion, and to create a video to show recycling right for use at all of our Granville County schools and throughout the county. We've been working in collaboration with our waste haulers, our recycling centers, and recycling coordinators across the state and of the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality to make sure that we are all preaching the same message. You know, this is what needs to be recycled and this is the best way to do it. So this is part of that campaign. We are um, trying to put out a very simple message with four categories and please don't bag your recyclables and make sure that you keep the certain items out. It's a hard message to get across to a lot of different audiences, and it is, um, it's ongoing. <laughs> it's ongoing to try to get that message out. So thank you so much for your time tonight, and I really appreciate you honoring me tonight, and thank you very much. Board members, do you have any questions? <clears throat>
I'm, I'm really impressed with, with what you're doing, especially Thank trying you. to save food. I'm older than most people here, and I grew up, you know, with saying, clean your plate because there's children starving in Korea. This was not long after <laughs> the Korean War. So wasting food has just been an anathema to me my entire life. But I have to ask you, and I love the idea about taking the food that a child doesn't eat mm -hmm. and, and recycling it, using it again. Right. But when you mention like apples and cups of strawberries, how, how do you do that? If, it's, if a child takes it and puts it on their tray and handles it, then how do you? Good question. There are safe measures in place that um, child nutrition has to follow the rules. And so therefore we have to follow those rules as well. So anything that would be a fruit such as an apple, they would be able to put it in their pocket and take it with them as they left um, and or they would be able to um, compost it in a composting facility um, or in a composting food waste diversion bin. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, otherwise, I, like milk and such things like that, that would spoil. You don't ever want to remove that from the cafeteria. No, no, I think I didn't phrase my question very no, well. It's okay. I thought I understood you to say that if, if a child goes through the line and gets an apple and a milk, let's say, doesn't open the milk, well, that right. milk is fine, and you right. could use that milk right then for someone else. But say they have an apple or a cup of strawberries, which cup is not strawberries sealed. strawberries are in a plastic container. Oh, okay, they're have sealed. A, they have a plastic seal on you. them, so they're usually frozen, and they're like a little dessert, so they're able to, to eat you. that. So, so the apple... It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be like a cup of strawberries in like a bowl that you would get. I got you. But right. the apple is a regular apple. It's not... An cup. apple is an apple is an apple. So <laughs> we can safely... Billy can have an apple and Billy decide he doesn't want it. Take it home with him no, no, but, but can it be reused that day by someone's no, skin? No. Okay, okay. No, I understand. Never. Not, it, that, that's the safe practices that were put gotcha. in place, and there is um, some slides that were sent out by Child Nutrition just last week on that. For you so share, the share tables. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. The share tables is what they are called. Yeah. Pretty strict guidelines about yeah. temperature and perishable. Oh, gotcha. absolutely. Okay. Any well, other questions? Board members, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Great job. We Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. All right. Now we're coming to one of my favorite parts. The academic team is here to give us our March performance update. Good evening, board, board chair, board members. This evening's update is going to focus on DOG science, five and eight, and biology. And Ms. Curtis is our coordinator for our sciences this year. And after her presentation of our academic updates, she's going to give you some updates on the STEM and STEAM efforts that we have throughout the district. Well, good evening. Thank you for uh, evening. giving me a little bit of your time tonight to talk about what's going on in science. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is a new instructional framework that DPI has adopted um, around science instruction. So there are three big ideas you can see there on the screen, and we're focusing on this as in our PLC this spring to, to start to implement this, and then this is going to be a, a large part of our work over the summer as well. Um, so the first is the scientific and engineering practices, and I'm really excited about this because it embeds those STEM concepts in our science courses. In lots of places in our district right now, STEM is a separate thing. Um, you go to an elective or a special, mm -hmm. and it's not embedded in, in our coursework. So this is really a great opportunity, I think, for us to begin embedding some of those engineering classes, our in engineering concepts into our science classes. But it's not just engineering. Um, as you, as you kind of go down the list, you'll see it's an inquiry-based model but you'll see there are things related to ELA, you see uh, construction arguments, evaluating um, arguments, communication skills, you'll see things connected to math, modeling, analyzing and interpreting data, computational thinking, those are all in there. So I'm really excited because it's really taking what you're doing in your other classes, what you're doing in science, and putting it all together. Um, it also aligns with our instructional framework that we introduced to students here in Bramble County last fall, where we're really focused on students being scientists, not learning about science. And that's kind of a mind shift for our science teachers. So we're not just saying, let's watch this video, let's see this PowerPoint. We really need, want our students to be scientists. Now this is a work in progress, but we're, we're getting there. Um, the next element is cross-cutting concepts. So we don't teach every discipline in science every year. That's kind of strange. I was originally an ELA teacher, and we teach informational text every year. We teach uh, 
fishing every year. We do fighting every year, and they grow as the years go on. But in, in science, we don't touch all of those disciplines every year. So, for instance, um, I might learn about some life science concept in first grade but not touch it again until fifth grade. So these cross-cutting concepts are actually things that exist in all uh, scientific disciplines, life science, uh, physical science, earth and space science. Those things exist in all areas, so we're going to teach these concepts so our students can strengthen their understanding of the concepts even though they're not touching all of the disciplines every year. And then finally there's the core ideas and as I just said, we don't touch every discipline every year but we want our teachers to really understand what kids need to know at certain points. So this really defines for us a vertical progression. Uh, teachers will understand what kids need to know at the end of second grade, what they need to know at the end of fifth grade, what they need to know at the end of eighth grade, and what they need to know at the end of 12th grade. And I've seen this firsthand this year, some misconceptions from our teachers. The first time I sat down with a high school teacher this year, they were just appalled because uh, their kids had not done well in this particular area uh, in biology and they didn't understand why this kid didn't know what a primate was and I said you know the last time they learned about that was in seventh grade and actually I don't think they learned about primates in that discussion of evolution in seventh grade and I went back and and they hadn't and my teacher's like oh I just assumed that that's what they were learning about but they were actually learning about evolution at a cellular level um, so there was just some misconceptions and I think that these vertical progressions will really help our teachers understand where their students are, what they need to know, their very clear competencies. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so that's the, the instructional framework. Another thing that I'm working on with our science teachers right now is uh, a, a, really a system for teaching vocabulary. And I selected this as an area of focus this year based on our test data, but also just in, in talking to them and interviewing teachers as I came into this position, what are your kids struggling with? And so, well, science has this vocabulary test, and they don't know all the words. How do we, how do we get them to really move that information? I've learned a word for this test, move it from short-term memory to long-term memory. So looked into what are the most effective methods for, for teaching vocabulary. This is the method that we're working with, Marciano's got some great research behind it, also aligns with what Dr. Dixie talked to us about this fall, about direct, explicit instruction about vocabulary. Um, so we are doing things like developing vocabulary games as a, as a group, because that's the last step. We're doing things like, are we aligned on what we all say that the vocabulary word means? So we're all teaching the same definition. Um, this is really important um, as kids develop that understanding. So that's, that's another focus for us this year. And then just some additional things that I wanted to highlight for you. We have some district-wide review materials we purchased for fifth and eighth grade to learn ed notebooks. And then last year, the end of the year, we created some district-wide ones for biology. I really excited <coughs> about plasma games. Um, it teaches chemistry concepts to our eighth graders, our um, earth science students, and our chemistry students. Um, I highlighted eighth grade because that's a tested area, but this company actually received a grant from the National Science Foundation based on some research out of NC State. Um, it's kind of like Fortnite. I'm not a gamer. Like, I didn't even have a Nintendo <laughs> growing up. But um, <laughs> I played it for about an hour. Seems kind of cool. I talked to an eighth grade science teacher about it today. She says, I caught a kid playing it last today. And I realized when I was on Christine, it was an okay thing for them to be on. It wasn't one of those jump games they go to, but it was <laughs> them actually wanting to play a chemistry game. Um, we're currently conducting an inventory of science lab materials and, and the needs assessment. As uh, Teresa talked about, we have stuff everywhere. Sometimes teachers come and go, we don't know what we have, our standards changed and the materials are in the wrong place. Um, so we're working on that because we want teachers to have the ability to be inquiry-based and, and do hands-on things, but if they don't have the materials, that's hard for them to do. Um, we have some engineering and elementary kits that uh, we're using in elementary school, but again, um, highly in fifth grade because that's a tested area. I'm actually going to a training next week. I'm pretty excited about it to learn more about those. And um, our teachers from Toller and Butner STEM Elementary already know how to use them. I want to share that with um, all our teachers, especially now that some of those Toller teachers are kind of uh, spread out across the district. We want uh, them to be able to talk to their new peers about them and use those across the district. Um, we're doing some student engagement strategies um, as we get towards the end of the year about effective review practices because when we get close to that EOD time, we want to make sure that we're really doing a great job of review. 
And of course, we're uh, working in district PLCs to look at our benchmark data for identified student new needs, planning for spiral reviews and going back, what if, if we get some first quarter, we keep going back to uh, checking for alignment and then ensuring the use of our district curriculum analysis. Dr. McLean wanted me to talk to you a little about computer science. We've got a lot going on with that right now. Um, that's not in the slideshow, so just stick with me. Um, we are, um, North Carolina is implementing K-12 computer science standards in the 2021-22 school year. That sounds like the future. Um, <laughs> currently, I think we're in pretty good shape. The weird thing is I haven't actually seen the standards yet. They're getting published to us next That's month. Right. So I'm looking forward to looking at those. But I think we're in good standing initially just based on what we have going on already. We're currently teaching computer science at five elementary schools, all three middle schools, and three of our high schools. Um, some of that is a partnership with Vance Ramble, and some of that is campus, well, I was campus-based, but Vance Ramble's coming to one of the high schools and doing it, but we're teaching it uh, with our own personnel at one of the high schools. Uh, we also have some extracurricular things going on. Uh, five of our schools are starting Girls Who Code Club. Those are great. They are uh, encouraging the girls to girls get into STEM code. fields. Hmm. They've got K-5 ones that are literacy-based, so <coughs> read books and do hands-on activities. Um, and in middle and high school, it's based around um, uh, scratch programming, which is something that's really easy uh, for people that don't know a lot about coding to pick up. So you don't have to be an expert in computer science to host a Girls Who Code Club. Uh, but they also focus on helping girls uh, advance into college, and they're even doing networking for students after they get out of college now. So it's really exciting to see this organization grow, and I hope we can continue to grow it here in Ramble County. And then finally, we're having two family code nights in partnership with the Digital Stars from our tech department and the AIB department. Uh, we're going to do one in the north and one in the south this uh, March, April, for, uh, we'll just pick the dates this week. Um, and I'm excited about that as well so we can show our parents what's going on with computer science in, in Bramwell County Schools. So, uh, if there's any questions, you guys can. Board members, you have questions? Yeah. Um, good evening. Uh, what uh, these are all great. They all look great. What is the what is the plan for teacher uh, preparation? In other words, how are you providing professional development for teachers to be able to actually lead this and do this? Yes. So primarily, right now we're doing that through PLCs. I, I hope that we have some, uh, maybe a different calendar next year. We'll have some some exciting opportunities to do some of that PD. <laughs> Um, so in other the words, the, 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 the teachers haven't really had a structured... Yeah, we're doing it during PLC, uh, their PLC. Talk about what's a PLC. So after school meetings for 5th and 8th grade, we're doing it during the school day for biology. Um, and it's we, people in those content yeah, areas Yeah, those teachers are getting together, together with me, and we're, we're doing professional development during that time. What about for... Well, never mind. That's what, what about plasma games and engineering? And I'm just asking about... Yeah. And engineering questions. is elementary. Plasma games, came and training are eighth grade science teachers, chemistry teachers, and earth science teachers. Okay. So that's the target audience for those. Okay. And then the engineering is elementary. That's uh, that's a new one that's coming up. I'm getting trained next week, but so I can expand my knowledge around that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I have a couple questions. So yes, number one, if I understood you correctly, and I'm trying to think back when my two kids were at Norman Granville, which mm -hmm. was about five years ago. Yeah. We teach science in the seventh grade, and then not again until biology. Is that right? We that teach evolution. When that story I was telling was referring to the, the okay. evolution. Science is taught every, every year. year. Yeah. Right. I, re I remember yeah. that. So yeah. I thought maybe we changed. No, the discipline. <laughs> we don't cover every discipline. Just that. Gotcha. 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 It's, okay. It's okay. So it's real nonsense. I'm feel <laughs> very happy that you clarified that. <laughs> Sorry if I was unclear. I apologize. Well, I just. Wouldn't, I mean, I would have been shocked if we didn't teach science. And we teach it every year. Um, the second thing is, you mentioned girls who code. I, I gave a presentation to the board last week, or last month, about how our boys are falling so much further behind in girls in GPA and in college acceptances and in college attendance. Is there is there a, 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 a correspondence, boys who code? Is there something we're doing for our young men and our boys? You know, I, the girls who code was started by some really enthusiastic uh, women, and it is a, a an opportunity for young women, but um, it's a national it, organization. It's a national organization. Um, I, but can, can boys participate in Girls Who Code? 
There is no restriction on that. That's right. Uh, <laughs> restriction. There so no restriction. I think that'd be something good that we would try to encourage our boys to participate in. That. And family cove night is, is for the entire family. So when we do the family events, it's for everyone. Well, we have a cove day, don't we? We do. We have cove day. I think the research behind girls in cove is because statistically across the nation, the number of women going into the field was dismal. And so this was a push to get women to go more, more into the engineering and the mathematics and the sciences and things of that nature. But you're right, we need to do locally more to get our boys more right. enthusiastic. Okay. Well, and that, we're teaching, again, in school to all the students at five of our elementary schools, yeah. computer yeah. science, yeah. Three, all three of our middle schools That's and right. three of our high schools. So everybody's having access to these content. Mm -hmm. This is just an additional extracurricular so activity. Um, and all of that, all of the content, whether it's from Girls Who Code or through Family Code Night or through our computer science courses is provided through code.org. So they're all getting access to the same content and materials. And those computer science classes, even to elementary school, it's by the end of second grade, they have developed their own video game. I did it, I sent it to Dr. Meyer. He was very impressed by the video game. That I made. <laughs> so, so that begs the question about our boys. Um, for instance, nursing is dominated by females. Mm -hmm. I mean, could we not look at things in our mm -hmm. in our school yeah, district yeah. where we could encourage boys to go into and doctors now is more female doctors than male doctors and medical is more medical school students are females than males. So can we not do things to get our boys mm -hmm. encouraged and motivated and engaged in other scientific areas where they are underrepresented? Absolutely, and I actually. Uh, Ms. Rodebaugh, our CTE IMC, last week took, uh, I think, seven students uh, to see radiology and certified medical assistant. I was super excited when I saw the pictures because I think uh, the two young men that were on the trip were, were some of my former students. So I, they are, she is actively out there Very at the high school level recruiting non-traditional folks Good. to go on these trips and learn it, about it, the yeah, any sauce any for the goose has got to be sauce for the gander. We, we got to right. take care of boys. Dr. Meyer just said that there are boys in the nursing fundamentals class at South Ramble. So oh, yes. Good. I, think that's, I think it's really important to, to look at that. You're right. From, mm -hmm. from, Absolutely. From all we are not going to turn any student away from his or her dream. That's one thing we're not going to do. And I'm very pleased that the instructors we have, I don't think I have found that to be the case anywhere. We want everyone to have equal access. It would be really nice if we get more of our boys to become teachers. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> That's what I'd like that'd to see great. more <laughs> encouragement for our awesome. boys to go into education. Ms. Curtis, with yes, the sir. framework, is that following kind of the same premise that we did, the ELA framework, the circle, mm -hmm. the core? Okay. So we made a one for Bramble County Schools, and this is one that the state happened to adopt. And they're very... The things that we prioritized in our state, one, our Bramble County one, definitely are represented in this statewide one. So I was really pleased to see that we weren't going to need to go back to the drawing board. Good. Board members, any other questions? Okay. Oh, one. You mentioned there was five elementary schools. Which five were there? Oh, gosh. You're going to put me on the spot. Let's, let's see. There were two last year that had already done it when I came on. Uh, Tar River and Stovall Shaw had already started. Um, we have since trained Butner Stem Elementary, um, Cradle, and West Oxford, um, and I hope to bring Miller Manger on next year. Thank you. Did you, did you say this is being taught as an extracurricular, or is this being weaved in the science? The framework or the coding? With the, the whole coding the and coding? the computer science and everything, is this separate from science, current science instruction, yes. or? So in elementary school, they're going to go special. Okay. Middle school is an elective, and of course, high school is an elective as well. So that's why I'm really excited about the, the science instructional framework, because we're going to start bringing those concepts into the core class as well. Any, any thoughts on uh, digital badging to kind of help kids show off that they've mastered these skills? Or That's a great idea. Great idea. What is that? Um, <laughs> uh, well, uh, so that's a move that I've, we've seen a lot in, in professional development for educators where mm -hmm. it's kind of like a instead of taking a college course that takes you, you know, a semester to complete or a, a whole high school course takes you a semester to complete, um, you can demonstrate a competency in a small area. So... Um, you might demonstrate in, in um, say, computer science, maybe you would demonstrate a competency in um, HTML coding, and you demonstrate your competency by coding uh, a website, or you demonstrate a competency, and you get a badge for it. And so, oh. um, so you might go in some schools and see, uh, when I was at Bunchman Middle School, we did badging around the science components. 
uh, when the my teeth, components? Uh, it's <laughs> strategies for ESL students. Right. So when my teeth, there are eight components, and when my teachers could demonstrate competency in one of them, we would give them a badge for one. So then a fellow teacher could go to them and say, oh, you're good at this, you're good at um, right. uh, That's a great idea. this concept in SIOP, I can go learn from you. And so That's kids also can idea. do that. And our kids are earning credentials at the high school That's level, right. like certifications in our, in our um, CTE classes, mm -hmm. um, but they're kind of larger, but I think something like badging would be a great way to That's encourage great. maybe some of our students that are a little more reluctant, but like kind of some more uh, outward hunting fishing. That's Sometimes right. that great. encourages yeah. folks to do it as well. I think that's an interesting that's idea to, to think about. And for your boys, mm -hmm. that's that gamification. Right. Yes. That's we right. can start getting to that because boys tend to really like the video games and the background as to how you develop them and program them. That's one of the reasons I think why boys aren't doing as well in school is because they spend too much time on video games. Well, and that's where I think the that's Plasma Games Partnership mm -hmm. has, they've come up with a masterful idea of taking something like chemistry and gamifying it. Yeah. You know, when I look at my own nephews and what they ought to be doing in chemistry and biology, you know, when, when you put it to a game, and it's very similar to something like Fortnite, man, they're all over it. They'll, they'll learn it but it is the same information, it's just gamified. And it's absolutely incredible how this generation learns material. North Carolina Central is actually starting a degree program. They certainly are, in gaming. Next fall, yep. In gaming. It's incredible. <laughs> So how can you make money? I mean, how can you make a living doing oh, a degree in gaming? Oh, wow. You wow. Uh, like more money if you heard of Fortnite, the Fortnite, <laughs> Fortnite video game, they're right out of carry. Mm -hmm. And they make a, Epic games. They're making a killer. Yeah, Epic Games, right out of carry. Yep. You even make money winning so you, Fortnite. So you play games and you make money playing games? <laughs> or, 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 yes. developing or developing games. And developing big games, games, right? Oh. There are tournaments with yep. big, big, big money. Mm -hmm. All right, board members, any further questions for the academic team? I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Too, Mr. <laughs> Thank you well, Mr. Much. Rivers, we've learned something tonight called badging. <laughs> That's right. I'm impressed. That's right. All right. Thank you, academic team. Uh, we're going to move forward to, we have a policy for you, recruitment and selection of personnel, uh, policy 7100. You saw that in board docs. This was a, there was a paragraph that was left out that you originally uh, did not see in the approval. Uh, however, this is a first read, so you have a couple options here. Um, as a first read, we can move this on uh, and come back next month and approve it, or you can make a motion to waive that first read because it's just adding that paragraph in. May I yes, add, uh, Mr. Chairman, this was actually previously approved by the board and was omitted when we brought the revision. So it, it existed in board policy prior to October. Okay. Right. I, I have a, I read this and I have a question, okay. um, and it's a, it's a tough question. We, as human beings and as, you know, moral people, we, we want to give people second chances. We also want to protect our children. So if we have a, someone with a criminal history, how, how do we handle that? They, they committed a crime maybe as a youth. They, they armed robbery or something, and they served eight or ten years, and they've gotten out. How do we give them a second chance and protect our children? What's, how do we handle that? I, I'm, I'm just curious. I, I hate to think that a criminal record when you're young would affect you when you're 40 being able to get a job to support your family. So how how does this policy, how do we handle that? Maybe it's an HR question, but if... if it is. Dr. Ben Brown. Oh, it's a good question, and it's something that um, we pay a lot of attention to. So every potential employee undergoes a background check for their criminal record and sex offender record. And anything other than a minor traffic violation is flagged. And um, very rarely do we hire folks that have any sort of, uh, you know, previous convictions related to drugs, um, any, anything beyond a, a misdemeanor. We, we simply just don't hire those people. We don't, we don't take them into account. They're, they're, they're pretty much just removed from the, um, the hiring process. 
volunteering is, is a little bit different. Um, we, we have on occasion made some allowances with individuals if uh, those were minor and went a long time ago, and, and then we also limit their access to children unsupervised. So they may be a chaperone with their own child only. If they had a prior conviction for a DWI or something like that, we would go. Um, so if, if someone at age 18 or 19, age 20, commits a crime, and they get out of jail after three or four years, it's a felony, and they've had a 20-year record of you know, being a good person. I mean, we're we're trying to look at criminal justice reform in this country. We're trying to trying to help people. How? I mean, and I'm not saying I want to hire people that are going to endanger our children. I'm just asking this tough question, which has bothered me. That we would just, when I read this, it just bothered me that that. I mean, there's a prodigal son. People people change. People make mistakes, and then. So I, I think I, our attorney has. Well, I just did want to chime in. I mean, obviously, and I think this is not what you're talking about, but legally, anybody who's on a sex offender registry is is out from working in the schools. But um, what your policy says is that any offense over a minor traffic violation, then the superintendent and staff are supposed to look at certain factors um, that have to do with safety and honesty and integrity, which are the two main considerations. You know, you wouldn't hire someone for a finance position who has an embezzlement conviction, for instance. Um, so the policy lists that they're supposed to consider the gravity of the offense, how much time has passed, and what jobs they're seeking, and weigh those factors. So um, it does give them some guidance there. Um, and then if, by law, if you are going to reject someone based on their criminal history, there's certain notice that we have to give them just to make sure that it's not an error, you know, that the wrong thing hasn't come up on their criminal record or something. There's, you know, sort of a notice and an opportunity for them to explain if, you know, if there's some error in that criminal history, that potential. It's a tough, it's a tough societal question, and it's just, I, I just, I mean, I can just imagine some poor person in prison and gets his education degree and wants to teach and is reformed and is never going to get a shot. I will say that it's rather infrequent for us to get anything. I mean, 95% uh, right. of the applications we get are pretty clean. Yeah. And, and one thing that schools have to consider is, um, you know, every student in that classroom has a laptop in front of them and... And so the community confidence in teachers. No, no, it's it's a, it's you know. it's not an easy question. It just that bothered me, and I just I just don't know a way around it. I it's one of the hardest policies for me. Mm. It really is. All right, board. So you have this policy in front of you. What would um, again? You do not have to take action tonight. Uh, you could do a second read at the next meeting, or you could uh, take action tonight. What would be an appropriate motion to make? If the appropriate, if you would like to waive, is that what you're asking? Correct. You would, you can make a motion to waive the second read as well as approve the way it has been presented. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. I make that motion. motion. <laughs> Glad we could help you. All right. So Dr. Hulahan's made it a motion. Any second? Second. All right. Second by Mr. Beauty. All right. So keep in mind that th what this is is you're waiving your second reading as well as approving this policy. So any further discussion? One. Don't we have to do that separately? We have been you allowed to do it. have to. Yeah. If someone objects to doing two things in one motion, they can ask that it be divided. I was just thinking that somewhere in the past. We have in the past done it. Okay. All right. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Thank you, Dr. Wimble. All right. Next, uh, Dr. Wimble will be presenting some academic calendar revisions uh, based on our recent Snowmageddon. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. There are uh, four 
uh, exhibits here, I would direct your attention to the one that's sort of a summary document uh, that shows what happened uh, on the 21st of February when school was canceled due to the snow that we got. Um, the top table shows the impact for students for each of our three calendars, and then the table below that shows the impact on our employees or our, our staff. Um, so because, uh, as I mentioned in the past, our calendar is built around the requirement of fulfilling a minimum of 1,025 hours rather than days, we have some ability to forgive um, days that may have been missed due to inclement weather because we carry a surplus. And I'll show you what those look like in just a minute. But the recommendation here is that we simply just chalk that up as a loss of a school day for all three calendars. Um, for staff, what we are recommending, since that became a no day for staff, is that we would add an optional work day at the end of the academic year um, for all of our staff. That, those are our 10 month and um, 11 month as well. The 12 month would have to make a different arrangement, but we already have those uh, procedures established HR and finance on how, how staff should follow that. But uh, if you look here, this is just a, a screen grab of a spreadsheet that I keep, which is a running total of the surplus instructional hours, those hours beyond the minimum of 1,025. And as a good rule of thumb, just so you can know, about plus or minus six hours makes up a day, a typical school day. There's a little variation from elementary to middle to high. But so if you take, you know, for example, one of our lower ones, um, Granville Early College High School, they've got about a little under five days in the bank still. Phoenix Academy, so a little asterisk beside that, they're down to six hours, but of course they're an alternative school, so they're, uh, they're held to a different standard. They have the same number of, inst of instructional days as the rest of our schools, but many of the students there go to that school and then leave and go back to their base school. All right. So board, you have, yes, sir. Just, and this, I probably should know better. My under, so according to this, if we have a snow day, mm -hmm. the staff does not get paid for that day? Well, it depends on what we call right. for that day. The decision was made that, you know, that morning, I believe it was, correct, yes. Dr. McClain? That's right. Um, that the conditions were so bad that we felt like we shouldn't make it an optional work day. We simply called it a no day. A no day. Because it was so cold, there was a lot of black ice. So right. We didn't want people to feel sure. compelled to go to work. So. But, but they don't get paid, so we don't, we don't build into our budget. So if you don't, if it's a snow day and you don't work, you don't get paid. So, so the optional work day is a chance to make up that pay. Right. Correct. They work to make it. Right. Yes. Right. So that they still have the 215 days they that their contract mm -hmm. specifies. Mm -hmm. Now, salaried staff get paid a salary. They don't get deductions for a snow day, but it's your hourly staff, so they don't get paid. It's so the mm -hmm. teachers get paid, but they, they do. So, so I know that DPI says you have to have 215 days, but they're paid a salary. It's not... And what happens is our pay, pay the way the um, the pay period goes an, an additional day, like we include an additional day in that pay period because that was a no day. So, so, <laughs> so, so like that's so that's why yeah yeah it's like a summer yeah, day. So that's why you have to add that optional work day because we have to have ten month staff has to have two hundred and fifteen days work two hundred and fifteen days. It's just to be like our clerical staff, our custodial staff, our child nutrition staff, those are the classified personnel you're talking about, the hourly. They, hourly. they, would, they would not that's get paid different. if you didn't, if they all didn't come to the making. Yeah, that's different. All 10-month staff. All ten okay, the certified staff. personnel. Right, yeah. Both, both classified and certified, the way that we pay our classified, with the exception of bus drivers, um, the majority of our classified are paid on a salary basis. Mm -hmm. So we're, we pay them the same, on the same schedule as we do the certified, um, certified staff. Yeah. So they, that day at the end of the year makes up that day that they miss. Gotcha. Um, so, but they're not reduced a day in that pay period because we shift that pay period one more, uh, one additional day. We just change the calendar. And there was some confusion, I think, in the public that we, 
made some kind of change in that. We were aligning to what DPI had always told us to do, right? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Right, and, and what and our legal our, advice yeah. is um, as far as... When we had that memo a couple of years ago, because everybody kept saying, well, why can't we just begin today? To right. Uh, so it's Which more aligned it's not to what our, we're supposed to do. I mean, the, the very gruff principle is a lot of this is state funds. It's not our money. We can only pay people for work that they did. We can't pay them to not work. Okay. Any further questions, board? Yes, um, I was just wondering about the fluctuation of the different surplus hours. I mean, there's so much different. I mean, for instance, why does Butner STEM Middle School have so much that you know, they've got 59? That's a great question. So all the elementary schools have been calibrated to be the exact same. The reason Stovall has three hours less is because they had a water main break and they got out early mm -hmm. on one day. So that's why they're less. The middle schools, they do have a little bit of variation in that they, they have the same start and stop times, but they don't have the same number of instructional minutes in a day. It's interesting, just five minutes, a five minute difference in one day can mean almost two full days of instruction over the course of a year. So just hmm. shaving a minute off of your lunch period or adding two minutes in transition during your daily bell schedule, you know, or if one school, their capture is only big enough so they have to have four lunches and while the other school has three, it build, you know, it can throw things out of whack a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so they try, to, they try to maximize the instructional minutes, but there's, there's some variation. All right, board, this is uh, brought to you as a recommended action from the staff. And so that you see what they're recommending, uh, we'd entertain a motion now. A motion to accept the changes that on the calendar. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second. So I have a motion by Mr. Udy and a second by Ms. Allred to accept the recommended action as presented by Dr. Wimborne. Any further discussion? See that? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Uh, next we'll hear from Dr. Wimborn for dual calendar programs. Uh, dual calendar is what our year round is. And so he's going to give us an update. If you remember, we got a snippet of information during a work session last month. And then this is bringing, <coughs> bringing the rest of the information to you. That's right. So if you'll recall, Dr. Thompson and I presented some information about the dual calendars. Um, we're now in our second year of implementing that. This year, it's at Butner STEM Elementary, Butner STEM Middle, and West Oxford Elementary School. And this is just a summary of the data that we shared in that slideshow that night. Um, you can see that there's been a decline in enrollment. Um, in fact, we didn't have enough interest to continue it at Northern Granville. Um, the recent survey results of, uh, of the schools that are participating in this program showed that 29 or almost 30 percent expressed an interest in a full year-round calendar and 58 percent uh, stated a preference for the traditional calendar. Um, also, we calculated um, the estimated costs associated with this program and that included uh, additional staff, transportation, child nutrition. Um, what's not built into that figure is sort of the loss of efficiencies we face when having those two calendars in the same building. Our class size has become a little lopsided. Um, our year-round classes tend to be a little smaller, which puts pressure on our traditional calendar class sizes to be larger because we can't just add another, we can't afford to just keep adding teachers to make that up. And then finally, uh, the academic results really just, in the aggregate, we, we did not see any significant statistical difference in growth or efficiency. Yes, Mr. Eden. I was very disappointed at the way the teachers started this out, and that's why we didn't see an academic uh, result increase because the teachers went and targeted the high students because they wanted to make their job easier in year round. I talked to Dr. McLean about this earlier. Um, they didn't go after those that were low and needed this to keep them from falling back during the summertime or an extended time off. But because of the uh, 
decline in the way things have gone, um, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we terminate the year-round school. Okay. All right. Do we have a second for that? A second. All right. So we have a motion by Mr. Udy, a second by Mr. Rivers to discontinue the dual calendar. Uh, would that be beginning with this upcoming school year? Yes. Okay. With the 2021 school year. Any further discussion or questions? My, my concern is that I don't know if a year is enough time to see if there's any. It's been two years. To, I mean, well, okay, two years. I don't know if that's been enough time to actually see if it would work. I mean, <coughs> what do the parents think about the year round calendar? Dr. Wimborn, do you have? Yes, so those survey that? results. Um, I believe it was uh, not a very strong overall response rate for the parents? Um, from the parents that asked were at the schools. And Dr. Thompson, I can't recall that number off the top of my head, but the, the response rate was somewhere less than a third um, that actually took the survey. And then of those, under a third said that they wanted to keep it. So it was kind of a third, almost two thirds in favor of Yes, um, <coughs> Ms. Allred, I understand what you're saying. The biggest thing to me is the expense and to be spending that kind of money um, and there doesn't seem to be an overwhelming level of support from the parents or from other folks. I just don't think that it it's appears to be, uh, working may not be the right term, but it appears to be something that the question is, are we getting the bang for our buck? And besides the 200 grand, if I heard you right, Stan, it also has some other efficiency related issues and class size things. And I want to compliment uh, Dr. McLean on her entrepreneurship to give this a try. And we have, and, and um, I, it's not worked out, uh, and there's nothing wrong with trying. There's nothing wrong with it not going great because if you don't try, you stay the same. So anyway, that's why I would support this motion. I appreciate that, Dr. Houlihan, and our entire board for supporting this uh, for two years. That is, that is all I ask, mm -hmm. is that we give it a try. Um, and we did that. Those teachers and families on the year-round calendar love their calendar. And those in the schools on the traditional calendar love their calendar. The difficulty is what Dr. Houlihan has illuminated, and that is when you've tasked us with where there could be financial savings right. in this budget year. Um, the staff has looked at where we've had to find ways to make things work, and this has been one of those places that I knew I was just keeping it together, finding funds to keep it together. Um, so I just wanted to be transparent with the board because you did allow us the opportunity to try it. Yeah. Mr. Newton. And one other thing that um, changed my mind is talking to the teachers. I found that some of these year-round classes had only nine kids. The rest of the teachers in that grade level at 25 or better because mm -hmm. they were having to make up and it just seemed like the classes were getting bigger but the year round was getting smaller so I just it was just not feasible I, I would like to echo what Dr. Houlihan said too I think it is important that we try things and we don't be afraid to fail we don't be afraid right. We, you know, we try something, and if it if it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, so okay, we know now we won't go that route. We learn from it, and you know, we move on, and, and, and are happy that we tried. So I appreciate also that, that you gave that a go, um, and <coughs> I also appreciate even more that when you recognized it wasn't probably having the results we wanted, that you were willing to say let's let's look at something else. Any further comments? All right. So you've heard the motion to discontinue the dual calendar programs for the 2021 school year, made by Mr. Beauty and seconded by Mr. Rivers. Uh, we've had discussion. 
you're ready to vote, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Next, uh, still speaking about academic calendars, uh, we have tasked Dr. Winborn to come back to us. Um, we have been presented some opportunities to possibly change our calendar. Uh, this has been presented in several different ways. You had survey results that were given to you. Uh, this was discussed at length at the night at the Masonic home. And so now, Dr. Winborn, if you'll present to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so there are, again, multiple files, multiple exhibits under this section. Um, I thought maybe perhaps um, I would start just by showing you some of the survey results. Um, these represent um, the tallies as of Thursday when we posted to board docs. So we had a very strong response, over a, a thousand. Um, and you can see the three choices that were presented. So the first calendar, calendar number one, is the traditional. That's the one that looks a lot like this year's calendar in its structure. Calendar number two, also a traditional calendar, is the one with the lopsided semesters that ends first semester early before the winter break. So there's maybe 80 days in that semester and almost 100 in the second one. And then the third one is the innovative year-round calendar option. And that's um, the one that is, is something new for everyone to check out. So blue um, in these bar charts represents first choices. So you can see that calendar number three, the innovative year-round, was overwhelmingly almost two to one um, people's first choice. Um, and then I also think it's good to look at the tallies for the third choice. Um, calendar number one has the most third choices, or it's the least like of these three. So based on these, um, these results tonight, what we've decided to do is bring you two <coughs> calendar options. Um, I think we can safely rule out number two. Um, not, it didn't have a very strong first place finish, and there were a lot of people that you know, chose it as their second or third choice. So tonight, um, you'll see that there is calendar option one, which is the traditional, and um, we have also gone through and made sure these are, we've double and triple checked, we've added in all of our PD days, our early release days, our times for report cards, so on and so forth. So these, are, these calendars are a little more fleshed out than the ones that I shared in the meeting. So calendar number, number one tonight is the traditional, and then number two is the innovative year-round. So there are just two for your consideration tonight. Um, also, you'll see here, though, however, there's also Bramble Early College's calendar. And I worked closely with Principal Harris and uh, their, their instructional lead, Marty Newton, to develop this calendar with them based on Vance Bramble's calendar. Mm -hmm. And there really is very little wiggle room we, we just kind of have to make it fit around that scramble. And um, they're very happy with this. They think it's, it's all in all, it's really good. We're very pleased that Vance Scramble finished their calendar early this year, so mm -hmm. that's where we're putting that. Um, the only other thing that I would uh, note is you can see this checklist, which kind of compares uh, the three calendars to make sure um, that we've satisfied uh, some of these requirements. Um, of course, the traditional the start and end dates, you can see they don't apply to the innovative year round or the early college one. All three calendars have 215 days for staff. Or, um, you can see the counts of the days. Both the traditional and the innovative have 182 days. So they have the same number of student days. Um, they all have the correct number of holidays, annual leave days, and they have the same number of work days. Calendar number one and number two. So they're very similar in, in what they contain. They're just scheduled differently. Can you sense. pull up the innovative one again? Yes, sir. Up on that. And and talk us through this. I know we've talked about it before, but I just just to give us a, another opportunity to understand it. I'd be happy to. So um, 
probably the biggest thing that you'll notice is that school is starting earlier mm -hmm. for this calendar, about two weeks earlier. So staff would be coming back the first week of August instead of the third week, okay? And um, so the kids would be starting at a time probably that some of you may remember that used to be the case 15, 20 years ago. We used to do that, right? Um, so then they, they go into September. Of course, we've got the holiday there. We have a nice required professional development day um, early on in the year. It's a full required day. We've got second quarter ending in October. There's an early release for parent com conferences that follow. November has a, another early release professional day built in for our staff. And we've got a holiday and an actual election, election day here. Election. And then um, for Thanksgiving, we're giving everyone that Wednesday off, which seems to be very popular. And then probably the most wonderful thing about this is that we finish our first semester before the winter break. So these last two days are early release. This one's early release for everyone. This is early release for high school because of exams. And then we have traditional two weeks of winter break. But then we have a third week, and this would be a time for our intercession. It would be a wonderful time to have some of those coding camps or STEM camps or things that Ms. Curtis talked about. We can have remediation. Um, you know, really, there's, there's a lot of possibilities there. We could offer some wonderful things as parents. And then they come back, third quarter begins. Um, we've got another professional development day in February for our staff and then spring break falls uh, right before Easter. And then April and May are pretty much wide open because these are, this is crunch time. This is you know where everyone is really focusing on pushing at the end of the year so that you have those nice and free and clear, not a lot of disruptions, and uh, we're able to finish the year strong with students going home before, right here, um, Memorial Day. So um, we have our work days that follow, and then three weeks of action-packed intercession. And we could use that for retesting if the state's still doing that, um, camps, um, you know, accelerated learning, you know, the sky's the limit. Dr. Winborn, where do you anticipate graduations falling for our comprehensive high school? Well, I would have to defer to Dr. Myers and his team, but I think we would probably push to, uh, to have them this weekend. It would be tight, but you know, we've done them on a quick turnaround like that before. Which weekend, I'm sorry? The 29th and okay. the 30th. But we could also look to the, to the next Friday, Saturday if we needed to. It's still a lot earlier than we're currently doing. I would encourage us to do that because of the holiday. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. One thing that I like about this calendar is, is December, because these high school students are hooked that are on that four by four. They finish up those two, take yeah. their exam, so they don't have to worry about anything. And when they come back in January, they start two new classes. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like that. I'll be very honest, for performance purposes, I have to say once I learned what a few other districts were at least experimenting with out there for the sake of seeing how students were going to perform. Some of the correlations they've experienced with this year thus far have been to the tune of eight point increases in their mid-year results. That, that really struck a nerve with me. Mm -hmm. And I get it because if you test me now on what I just learned, that's a far cry from what I'll do after you give me two or three weeks off. And so I, I just, for the sake of performance, knowing that that was our priority this year, and hearing what young people said to me about what they thought was best, that is the only reason I even brought it. So you talked with students. Talked with students. And they liked it. Stu not only did they like it, I thought, I thought they were going to jump across the table <laughs> because it, it really, um, in, you know, it doesn't have too much in there for elementary, but once your credits start mattering on the high school level, they were like, please, you know, we need to finish before the holidays. Mm -hmm. There were two arguments. One, we're tired of getting in trouble for not studying over the holidays when it's our Christmas break too. Or you have those that honestly, they were explaining, we have some friends that really don't care and they aren't going to study over the holidays. And when they began to understand about test scores and the impact on the school 
and how it made the school look, they were concerned about that. So we, you know, for me it was trying to find a way to get students to be assessed before the break. And that is what this calendar does. So we searched all over the state and just got tons of options. Dr. Quinn, I believe you had one student on your advisory committee that even talked about the course that they were taking at the scramble too. Because That's this, right. And this they now finished. aligns with that. This now aligns oh. with those courses. That's right. That was another one they, they sort of threw out. Did you have a question? I, I did. Uh, with our, our budget problems, how do we pay for the intersessionary days? So maybe an answer to that from the HR. Very side. similar. Absolutely. So those are those those I days are no days. They're not right. part of the two hundred and fifty days. That's right. So That's these right. would be an opportunity for us employment. to hire staff. Right, but where are we going to get the money? Well, so we currently already do a lot of camps and programs and things like that. So we, you know, grants. Different that's grants. Right. grants um, Remember, intercession is like summer yeah. spread throughout the course of the year. So we have summer camps in the summer. We sort of have summer activities spread throughout. So if I understand you all correctly, then our money that would pay the pace for currently our summer camps would go into the intercession days, so we would not have the summer camps. It could, but then those big eyes at the end of the year, you know, we should do some summer reading camps and things there as well. That's where the bulk will go. We have really just a few days there in January, so about three days, remediation funds that we currently have, we would probably keep those intact. Um, a couple of clubs, from what I understand from other su superintendents, uh, club activity, field trips, that's a good time to take field trips so you're not losing class time. Mm -hmm. Just an array of ideas. It's a great time to do some fun things. And then the June calendar, you're saying that those I days could conceivably not be there. They could conceivably be in July. No, we, we probably want to stay away from July so that people have a, at least one whole month. We want to, to keep them in June, but that would be the summer camp. Those dates would be the summer camp dates. And so for the students, it looks like they would at least have a week off to kind of decompress and all that. So we would, those, those the red days right. are no student days. And I mean, conceivably, you could even drop the Friday I day. That's right, that's right. We could do a couple of things. It, it, it might just give the students more buy-in if they okay. have at least, you know, a week to kind of, just to kind of mm -hmm. do their thing gaming it. career. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at it and I'm thinking, because I, I worked in a middle school that had a year-round calendar, and that was the greatest secret that, you know, other people didn't catch on to. Because we used those days, like in January, those I days, that would be a good time to bring in those students who are struggling and maybe get them a jump start before everybody else come in and go ahead and expose them to the curriculum and, and work with them a little bit. So it gives a lot of flexibility and usually what happened, at least from my experience, when we had those I days, other uh, organizations and stuff stepped in. Mm -hmm. They had the YMCA and the Boys and Girls mm -hmm. Club and they right. partnered with the district and they offered clubs and stuff like that. So we gave them the space, they ran the program more of the kids, so it really gave kids a chance to get exposed to a whole lot of things that they would never get a chance to do horseback riding and on a field trip and stuff, so it, this is huge. This would be a huge plus. You know, another thing that you could throw in there, just an idea, get a teacher or some volunteer to set up a um, students to go to places like ACIM and to yes. volunteer mm -hmm. oh, around, gosh, the, yes. around the county and around the area because Currently, they don't really do that much of that, and the kids that do, I know at ACIM, they love it. And given that, I mean, I'm throwing. I mean, there will probably be six thousand different ideas, but you know, that'd be great time for volunteerism. Mr. Oh, well, go ahead. Well, I was just going to note. I think I mentioned this before, but I, I am duty bound to tell you that there is the risk of um, a sort of legislative override. This is an a new option that districts are trying obviously doesn't meet the statutory start and end date because it's year-round. 
which is what we're calling it. Um, and year round is not defined in the statute. And it's, and you know, it's so it's an interesting idea, but just know that there is some slight risk that the, or I don't, I can't quantify the risk that the legislature may come back whenever they come back and and change your ability to do this. Mr. Reed. That's what I was going to say, is that she had brought that up, but I was going to add to it, is I'm sure we'll tell them no. <laughs> right. Um, that was one of right. the things I used to do in law enforcement. I went where I wanted till someone told me to leave. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> <laughs> Look, <laughs> she's coming. <laughs> so move it on. Yeah, let's go, Mr. So do we need a motion? <coughs> yes. So the options that have been presented to you by the staff, option one is our traditional, what we're used to now. Uh, option three is this new innovative year-round calendar. Uh, so we would entertain a, a motion on what you would like to do. Option three or what three? So I'm sorry. I'm saying three. It's called two now. Right. Okay. So let me phrase this. Traditional that we're used yeah. to or the innovative year-round. Yeah, with the intercession, with the intercession, just to make sure. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Um, being that we just eliminated the year-round schools, I'm just thinking, now we're calling this an innovative year-round. To me, that's going to be very confusing to Well, parents. if you notice that we were, there was some nomenclature early on called dual calendar, yeah. and that was year-round. I think that's kind of, we were using those interchangeably. You're right. We're going to have to make sure that we yeah, promote be this well for educate. people to understand. Uh, because I remember when we started year round, Dr. McLean was having questions. They thought they dropped their kids off and left mm -hmm. them there for two months. Yeah. So <laughs> we got to make sure we publicize this correctly. <laughs> but, but we could certainly call it one thing for our parents, but we can call it year round for the state. Correct? Yeah. And we can give I, it a nickname. I would them. stick with year round. But we could just say the old calendar or the new calendar. Well, but, but I, th I agree with, with Ms. Yeah. Allred. I think that is going to confuse parents. Mm -hmm. They're going to think, what do you mean we're going year-round? We voted no. We wanted to go traditional. So we somehow have got to sell this, that it's really a traditional calendar with just a couple of added benefits. Well, I think part of what Stan's office can do is to expressly talk about that we got rid of the dual calendar where we're running the same calendars at the same time. This will be everybody, with the exception of Gr Granville Early College, is on this calendar now. I think that is where we can help with some of the confusion. Well, and I think if it's clearly stated it starts in August and ends in June, yeah. then, uh, but I think obviously um, people need to know early, as soon as possible, that's gonna start two weeks earlier in August, because that could already affect some people who have travel plans in August. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because I believe when I read some of the comments, that was the, the concern. And one of the things, because of it being this time of year, we do need to work with those families that have made vacation plans and things of that nature. We, we need to be clear to work with those families as a district. And I have one more concern. I'm sorry, but... Yes, ma'am. Okay, when we... When the idea of the year-round calendar was first um, encouraged, there was a big push about the summer slide. This calendar, there's still a long summer break there. I mean, how, how do you balance that? Dr. Myra or Dr. McLean, you want to answer that? It, yes, but it, it is an add-on. The 13 weeks has been cut down now to not seven, seven, and to half seven if you count intercession. So we've, we've cut it down significantly, and the hope is that people will take advantage of the intercessions to help throughout the course of the year as well. And they'll be optional? Mm. Well, everything won't be optional. We hope we can put some teeth in some of the necessary sort of mandated things for some of the pupils, but even at that, parents have to join us and partner with us on those. Right. Any further questions? And then are you ready to entertain a motion? Someone want to make a motion? Uh, go ahead. Oh, I thought you did. Okay. 
Yeah, I thought you did. Did you? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> because we, the numbers just look confusing. Okay, so you're saying the new calendar, option two. Okay, yeah. and I'll second it. Mm -hmm. So we have a motion and a, a motion by Dr. Houlihan, second by Mr. Udy, uh, that to approve the calendar number two as it's been presented tonight which is being termed as the innovative year-round calendar um, or the new calendar. Covers all three options. Okay. Okay. Any further? Yes, sir? Just toss this out. I was just thinking more about this August start date. Um, is it, and along with what Ms. Alvarez said, is it, is, it, is it worth considering starting this in 2021 rather than 2020 in August to give parents a year to adjust? And I'm just, is, so is that, I'm not just, I'm tossing that out. I'm not saying that's what I'm in favor of. I asked a specific question to Dr. Winborn when the calendar survey first came out, we started reading those. Was there a significant en enough people that were kind of worried about starting soon because of plans? And according to what we got in versus who has made the comments, I don't think it was a significant amount enough to delay it. Now, I struggle with the same thing because we're going to have some people that, no matter how much y'all work with them, they're still going to have something to fuss about. But I think we are tasked with looking at the overall what's best for the entire county. Would just be my, my personal thought. I will note that it is difficult to plan that far ahead for what our calendar law is going to be. You, it's, just, it's hard to say what the law will be. You mean 21, <laughs> 22 or whatever it is? And you're saying there's a chance that the state will come back and say, you can't do this, and we're well, back to our original calendar, which is starting in late August. What's happening right now is the legislature passed a law last year or the year before that the state board has to collect a list of everyone who is not meeting the start and end dates of the traditional calendar and submit that list to the legislature. And, that's, and, th and so that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and that's where it stands. Like the state board isn't taking action against anyone, um, one way or the other. They're just reporting it. Um, but there's just a concern that the legislator asked for that list for a reason. So would that be? It's really hard to say. Board when we start. Okay. So the motion on the floor now is to approve the calendar for the 2021 year, uh, made by Dr. Houlihan and Mr. Udy. Is there any further discussion? You're ready to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. All right. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry? Yes. Um, they, okay. So if you, Dr. Winborn, if you'll tell us about Grand Royal College. Yes, sir. So it, it's just presenting the calendar. Yeah, correct. Yes, sir. Okay. The same so, so you have the, the um, calendar there for Grand Royal College. Do you have questions for that? Dr. Winborn, that matches Vance Granville. Uh, it puts them in compliance with what they need to do for our stuff as well as Vance Granville. Correct. Do we need to approve this? We yes, do. Sir. Yes. I make a motion that we approve the 2021 calendar for Granville Royal College. Okay. We have a motion by Mr. Yu. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Second by Ms. Alward. Is there any further discussion or questions? See that all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Thank you. All right, now we move to summer second testing. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Myrick and Miss Beth Cook. Board, we're bringing you three options again this evening for our summer second testing. Uh, Miss Cook has to submit uh, testing plan to um, DPR by the first week in April, by the first Monday in April. And so tonight we're bringing you three options and she's just going to go through these. Um, you did see these options before. I believe it was in our November meeting. So. We talked about them during our academic updates, but we did not take a vote on them at that time. We're just going to refresh the memory tonight and so that we can um, have a vote so that she would know what to submit to the state. As you all will recall, 
the very first, I went ahead and made our perfect option what we have historically done in the past, which is take the required work days that are already in the calendar and have the teachers remediate students during those required days and test during those days so that there isn't a cost for teachers to be employed outside of their you know regular day. The cafeteria, there's federal money. <coughs> they are not charged in the summer, so there is no cost for breakfast or lunch. And at this time, we have four days that we would need bus drivers and um, gas, and with a day of hurricane and a day of snow where the bus is set for two days, we've got that gas in the bank. And of course, my cousin Eddie and the farmer's almanac, it's going to snow one more time. So we might have a third day, and it'd be a little cheaper than right now, option one being two days of gas for buses. Hold on one second. Beth, do you use the almanac when you do the budget? Cousin Eddie. Okay. All right. So make sure. He farms, has about 100 cows. You know, it's very important. But um, right now, this is the um, least. Um, it's the most cost effective. Did I say it right? Okay, so that's option one. And option two would be two weeks long. What if we added a second week in there? Um, and we remediated for six days and tested for two. So that would be our four optional days and then the next week. But if I'm correct, did we not just add another optional day onto the end of the year? Yes. Monday. Uh, that Monday, so but it's an optional day. So if teachers opted to work that day, then that might be one day that we wouldn't have an extra cost because the teachers would be there and it would already be part of their salary. But that's not a huge amount of difference. Um, if we take a look at the cost for that, that would be teachers at around 35.5 and transportation and fuel around 41, total of 76. You know, those numbers might make more sense if I show you option three. Recall back in November, we discussed two, op two things then. We talked about the least, if the least cost, which was my historical plan, and then the second one, which was a wish list about camp with like three weeks of doing math and science and some cool stuff. So that's option number three, which was what you guys saw in November. And um, the estimated cost there was 195, 194. So I simply took the 71 and cut it in half. And then the transportation, I, I divided that into threes, into by three. So that's where the number came from for option two. And I cleared that with Miss Day and um, Harry Wilkins on my calculating for option two. Estimate, of course, not exact. So what we're asking tonight is, and wow, in lieu of the fact that we just started school a little earlier in August, this is June. Are we looking at a one week in June, a two weeks in June, or a three weeks? So it's an action item. All right, board, you see here uh, these options you have. What questions do you have for Ms. Cook and Dr. Meyer? Uh, the children who, who are going to need their mediation Mm -hmm. um, do we have any data that shows whether or not that remediation helps much? I mean, obviously, there is motivation. There's issues now starting their summer. There's cutting into their summer. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just looking at a, at, at a child who maybe didn't do that well, is not that engaged, and now we say we want you for two more weeks in the summer, and then you got to take your test. Do we have any data that shows that that's effective? I mean, or is that is that... I can certainly tell you that DPI allows this and it increases our proficiency, not our growth. And I can tell you that when we summer second test students, they're gonna, a, a good number of them are gonna pass. There are so many that barely missed it and then when they take it a second time, they do really well. And there are some kids that have historically done well on their EOG and they just might have stomach ache that day and just blew it. And then they get a second chance and they just knock the top off of it again. Right. I understand. No, I think the second testing is excellent. Mm -hmm. But the question I'm, I'm asking is do we have any data that would support oh, I, I have data in two to show or three you what weeks? What the scores are 
before they sung the second test. Right, I'm talking about the two or three, option one basically is not much remediation, correct? They just had the option to take True. the test yeah. again. Well, we've or whatever remediation before, during the school year. I don't have any data to show you six days of remediation yeah. versus three weeks versus two days, so no. Well, what, what, one of the things I will say, um, when the state was allowing us to start testing earlier in the school year, and then there were two retests that came along, the scores at both of those retests went up um, considerably, and there was a longer period of time for remediation for those students during that time, and they were still in school. This, this option, like you said, the students are out there already thinking about being at home for the school year. We haven't done that in our county, so it's hard to say. I got you, so we don't have data, right. basically. Mm -mm. I see. Sorry. This was brought up because, again, the, the goal was performance this year. And if you recall from one of my personal goals with you as a board, it was what can we do? What should we do? And I do think there's, there's something to this thing of having children for a period of time, especially if the state allows it. Um, there is a cost element to that. Mm -hmm. There is a cost. Um, and it's probably a fun balance cost. So I want us to be very intentional when we think about do we want to have children for two weeks to really saturate them and try to give one more opportunity, a quality opportunity for reading, math, and science or wherever they may have fallen short. Do we want to have them for three weeks? We know we have to get it done before the end of June mm -hmm. in order for the score to count. We know that. Um, what we've done around here was just take advantage of the last couple of days, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is that good enough, or can we do even better? And what I'm charged with is offering you suggestions on what might be even better than what we've done. And Dr. McClain, if I may, uh, when I talked to Harry about the numbers, these numbers are worst-case scenarios okay. in terms of transportation. That's They're right. worst-case scenarios also in terms of the teachers because we don't know how many of our students will need to be remediated or where those students live. Mm -hmm. So that would be, um, those, those factors will cost in there. So both numbers were estimated on the high end. Thank you. Ms. Day, um, so I'm assuming, am I correct in assuming that this would be a fund balance request? Mm -hmm. okay. Is there any opportunities for grants or anything from the state to help facilitate some of this along with that? Dr. Mike, it's, it's hard to get the kids to come back three days that there's no school. It's, I think it's going to be even harder to get them to come back for two weeks. Um, how are you going, and my question is not doubt the plans, but my <coughs> question is how are you going to market this to get them to come back for two, much less than the two weeks? Well, one of the things that um, Ms. Cook stated before, camp, calling it camp in some form of um, and even looking at an opportunity to maybe extend the day where the students will have the opportunity in the morning to have that instruction, but then providing something in the afternoon. Because we do have some camp funds this summer um, for those two weeks where we can extend the afternoon where it would be something fun for the students. That's the the camp funds, I thought we just said we didn't have any money. Camp is different than remediation. Right. We have some we have some funds this year that we are able to use for some summer camps. That we can't allocate yeah. it to yeah, yeah, that we, can. we have to combine those items. To make for a longer day. Yeah. And I can tell you from my personal work, this may actually even help out some of our families in the whole deal of finding child care during the summertime. One of the biggest things that, that my business I was part of was we have a waiting list of parents trying to find something to fill certain weeks, mm -hmm. and typically camps do not start this quick. So not only are we getting the instructional remediation piece in the front part, mm -hmm. but if we do combine it for that longer day and use those funds to make that happen, then you're actually probably helping some of those parents as well, if we market that <laughs> right to be able to do that. But however, I, I, I will say this, um, that I'm limited in, in who can work at those camps. 
So in fact, the you know the teachers being willing um, to give up some of their time in order to do that. But we have applied for summer camp funding through some grants, um, but we would not know what those funds are or if we got the grants until fall to the end of the school year. Forward. What other questions do you have, Doctor? Yeah. What is the difference? Um, what was the what is what have we been doing in the past? Uh, and how does that relate to option one? Um, in the past, we've done, we have remediated and tested during the day that the teachers are already there. We haven't paid them anything extra and extended it past those required work days or optional days. So with option one, that, that wouldn't be, we wouldn't be asking teachers to do that anymore. Is that correct? We would be, yes, we would. We would be asking them to remediate those required days for two and then retest for the next two because they, they come to school on that Monday so they would bring the kids straight back Tuesday Wednesday remediate the math and the science we don't get to retest this the reading this year just like last year we couldn't retest the math because those scores come in October instead of right away so um, we'll test on Thursday and Friday yes, under option one when the teachers did the remediation, mm -hmm. they it was their classes, yes. and they knew what their weaknesses were. Yeah, now, yeah. if we went under, say, section option two or three, and yeah. they were not the same teachers, you have to hire new counsel. You you hire that, but how are they going to be? Um, that that's a challenge. Okay, I was going to say how, how are they going to know where these children's weaknesses are? That's a good point. That would be a challenge if we couldn't just locate it at satellite sites, we would need to have it at each school <laughs> and just extend it for two weeks. It's not something that we could combine three schools in one place. It would be too many. Um, but you're right. Have would the teachers to come back that second week. Would there be a mechanism to collect that data and kind of get it to that teacher? Mm -hmm. that they would have end of the year stuff, yes. They'd have their first test score. <coughs> It's not impossible by any means. We have to collect data for camp. Yeah. You know, yeah. Okay. It's it, it is, do we know of any other school districts who have tried this two week or three week program? Is there any way to get any data to see? I guess where I'm going with this is if we're going to have to go into fund balance, that's, that's pretty serious. And I still have a question as to whether or not these children are going to be motivated. The, the year's over, they've gotten through the school year. What? I got to come back for three weeks? heck with that and they just they just check out so I mean I'd like to because it's not required we're going to have to cheerlead them Ooh. to come no we can't require them to come back and do this oh. it, it's heartfelt um, come back it's not a requirement so yeah I mean, it's some serious motivation in them to cheerlead mm -hmm. and, and the bigger districts have done this mm -hmm. that have had the funding to do this so can we perhaps get some data to see whether it actually they they got any benefit from mm -hmm. it? H how much increase they got from first test to second test. Right, and we're going to have to do a cost benefit, and we're going to have to look at, you know, is it worth $194,000 out of fund balance that could pay for teachers or something else to get a one-point increase? My plan's due April 1st. I was going to say, well, Darren asked what your drop-dead <laughs> date is. Um, so this is my question. Are you going to need that data to make your decision? Well, I mean, right now I'm leaning towards option one. I just don't think we know enough. But maybe next year we might have then an opportunity to and get. Next year we'd have longer time with our longer summer. Right. We're ending early. Sorry, I had a. You had a, a, had a, a light bulb. A light bulb. Can you see that? Yeah. All right. So board, um, you have three options here. Obviously, this is our night. We probably need to make this decision. Sounds like it. Um, so if you don't have any more questions, we'll entertain a motion on how you would like to proceed. I move uh, we vote for option one. Okay. I second. So we have a motion by doc, uh, Mr. Rivers and a second by Mr. Dr. Houlihan that we would go with option one, which is our historical option, what we've done in the past. All right. What discussion or questions do you have? Seeing none, we're ready to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. So they I promise I will get as many kids in here to test and do better. So 
Ms. Cook, can you come back, um, obviously before next year, and bring us some historical data yes. uh, to tell us what is going on with some other districts? Yep, glad right. to. That'd be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, now we will move to Miss Day. Do you have an audit contract to bring us? Smith and White, which is the accounting firm that has been doing our audit. Um, this contract is for $32,500. You might ask why, why we bring this contract to you because the, the amount is under our threshold. Um, the, the board policy is attached there as well. Uh, related to the audit contract, this is a contract between the auditor and the Board of Education. So the Board of Education contracts directly with the, the audit firm because of the nature of the work that they do. Um, so I have reviewed um, audit prices for surrounding districts and we are, our, our fee is lower than Vance, Franklin, and Warren um, and slightly higher than Person, but Person is smaller than us. So I think this is a reasonable, it's the same amount that they charged last year, no increase. All right, so board, this does require your action because you are employing the auditors, and so we would entertain a motion from the board for an action. I move we approve Ms. Day's recommendation. Okay, we have a second. Okay. So we have a motion by Mr. Rivers, a second by Ms. Allred that we approve the audit contract with Anderson, Smith, and White. Any further discussion? All, right. All those in favor say aye. Uh -huh. All those opposed? All right. Thank you, Ms. Day. You'll stay right there. You have a budget amendment. And explain to some of us that don't know what these are. It's been so long. <laughs> I am very pleased this evening to be able to bring you a budget amendment and my regular financial reports tonight. Um, this is a budget amendment for the local fund. This is actually something that the board approved um, back in August, and it was not included um, in the original budget that you approved um, mid -fe in February, um, but this is for the $25,000 for the Communities and Schools Program, and so this is not an increase in the total budget, but it is budgeting for those funds that, as you had approved that program, the funding for that program back in, in August. Okay. All right, so board, this is a motion to amend the budget in the amount of 25000 there, as you see the document. Uh, We'd like to take action on that tonight if you're ready to make a motion. I'll make, go ahead, you, you motion to approve. There we go. Good job. Good job. That was a bold move. That was a bold move. Just saying budget amendments, if something flops, you gotta pay it. <laughs> <laughs> This is a, uh, a come on. And so we have a motion by Dr. McKnight. Do we have a second? Second. All right, a second by Mr. Yee to approve the budget <coughs> amendment. All the, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? You know, y'all have been fun tonight. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Don't mess it up. <laughs> All right, Ms. Dave, if you'll give us our financial update and our board travel. Um, board members, you have financial update as of January 31st, um, 2020. At that point, we are 58% through the year. Um, our percentages are in line and our expenditures are within budget. And again, I'm very happy to be able to pre present this information with the budget that you have approved. Any questions about that budget? Right All right. You also have the board travel? So board members, you have board travel as of January 31st. The, the budget for, well, that should say 1920, but the, the 1920 budget um, is 10624 and you, the expenditures to date as of January 31st, um, 2020, is 4598 So the remaining balance is $6,025.85. And you can see how that, um, as I've presented in the past, the board travel by board member and um, also on the left side each each event um, with the dates 
and then on the right side is the same information but just broken down by registration, lodging, travel, meal reimbursement. Um, so that's the four thousand five ninety eight fifteen cents. If anybody wants to come to the Spring Law Conference next month, you can see me present for free. <laughs> <laughs> is it free because you're presenting? You're our no. I, I was going to say, but you still got not free at all. You got to <laughs> not at all. <laughs> still have to pay the school board association. Mm -hmm. There is one thing I'd like to note on that for uh, travel. That that includes our training dollars. Uh, if you remember right, our March work session, we're discussing training. And so we need to come to that with the thought of, are there things that you know throughout the rest of the fiscal year that you want to participate in, uh, but, and how that will affect what we do as a board for training. And I have had that conversation with Ms. Day. So any further questions for that? All right. Good to see you back at the podium. Thank you. All right. Dr. Winborn, you have a facilities update. You got three items to bring to us. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. And I'm sorry if you don't mind. I'm Seated, but I'm driving the, You're good. the uh, bus. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the first item is a cell phone tower uh, lease inquiry that I had received. Um, it's from a contractor uh, that works with Verizon Wireless, and they would like to know if the Board of Education is interested in leasing a small parcel of property on our Mount Energy Elementary School campus for the placement of a cell phone tower. Um, and this initial letter that I've received from, from this gentleman talks about some of the possible benefits and uh, parameters that would go along with this type of agreement. I um, have only talked to him once on the phone. He sent me this. Um, I spoke with Ms. Dudison about this, and she actually might have some interesting information to share with you. Sure. I mean, these are not unusual for school districts and can be worth it. Um, what I told Stan is, um, and we have we have a lawyer in our office who's negotiated a lot of them. I would ask for more money than this, but um, anyway, I think we would try to negotiate a higher rate. Um, but the only sort of things we watch out for is 25 years is a long time to commit to keeping. You know, so we we look at whether they're married to that term, although. Looking at the Mount Energy campus, it's not like this is in town and there could potentially be another use for that 100 by 100 square foot plot. There's no neighbors around it. It's um, it's pretty isolated, so it doesn't raise the same issues that some other sites might raise. Um, but they, you know, they maintain it. It's something that would require the board to give public notice, declare, you know, declare this patch surplus, and then give public notice that you're going to lease it. But um, so in any case, I don't have any big red flags other than we would try to negotiate a good deal and bring it back to you if you were interested. And, you know, the only thing is that then you have this on your land, so it does affect this land. This isn't a school that is on the consolidation plan at this point um, or have any indications that you're trying to do one thing or another with that site. And they haven't chosen the spot yet, right? They, they said if we're interested, they would come and and then do drawings. Uh, you remember, board, um, this something similar was brought to us a, a couple of years ago right. here at Central Office. Doctor Wren uh, had negotiated that for us, so that's something that we've had a little bit of experience uh, with, at least on one of our properties. And it's not yeah. um, a couple questions. One, it, it's great. If we can get income, especially if, if we can negotiate a higher rate, I think that's wonderful. The questions that I would have is it's 10,000 square feet that we now lose. So the question is we would have to make sure that, as far as we could tell, there was no intent to expand, to put another facility there, to put a whatever. Uh, and how would it affect us if we ever wanted to sell the property? I agree with you. The 25-year lease worries me. And the third thing, because um, I, I, I'd like to do it, but I mean, the third thing is, do we know, is there any concern about the cell phone tower and the proximity to children? Is there any radiation issues? So my understanding, and this is just from talking to Chris Gardner, an attorney in my office who, who handles these, is 
the, taking your questions in reverse order, sure. that these things are pretty highly regulated by federal law and there's not science to back up those concerns. Mm -hmm. um, I know that DPS has some, it's not unusual actually for um, schools to sell the right to put these on top of stadium lights. Um, <coughs> this particular location doesn't have a stadium, so that's, but um, that's one way that sometimes they are installed without being seen. Um, so, so they're probably more common than you would think on school sites. Um, as far as the length of the lease, I would certainly suggest like the ability to terminate earlier. Obviously, they're making an investment mm -hmm. that, you know, so it's understandably they, they want it particularly, you know, to, to be for a long term. And generally, what we commonly are able to negotiate is a, like an annual um, increase. Um, and one thing that we also like to talk to the companies about is they are likely to lease space on this tower to other shell companies. And so we have had some success in getting a um, cut of their re, I forget what they call it, but anyway, the, the re-leasing. Sub Subletting. Yes, and so that can bring in more funds. Um, but if, if so, if you were to sell the property, it would most likely be subject to the lease. Um, I mean, obviously the tower would be do physically there. Do we know if these things put out any obnoxious humming or like a high power line? Is no I that would annoy heard the students. That, but no, it's not I haven't that. either, and, and I know we like in, in Cre yeah, yeah. there's one here in Creedmoor. They're all over the water towers, and and they're beside a, a preschool and a couple other things there in Creedmoor, and, and there's never been okay. any kind of complaint. Yeah, and I'm not saying I just yeah. just we don't want to have a bunch of students there with. <laughs> I've looked crazy. at the property size of Mount Energy, but Stan's explanation was that. It is probably an area that's currently wooded. So I don't know how close it would actually be to the school. But we wouldn't, I mean, we're not asking you for approval tonight. Yeah. Stan just wanted to gauge your reaction it's before clear. talking to them any further. Essentially kind of what I asked staff to do was to bring it to us tonight uh, to kind of gauge your interest. And if you are interested, then we would actually have a representative come back to present with Sta Dr. Winborn. Uh, to answer some more technical questions at that point. Um, but we didn't want to invite them out if you're not even interested. So what is PM&A? What, what do they do? That's, this is an engineering okay. contractor uh, company that, that, that works for Verizon. They work on behalf of Verizon to locate and um, make arrangements for What would be the interest of the board? Would you like to have them come to a board meeting? I think it's worth hearing. I mean, again, if we're not binding ourselves to anything, it's sure. worth okay. yeah. right. Dr. Wimble, will you make arrangements for that? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, next thing is Joe Toller. Yes, sir. So uh, I actually have some good news. I got a call on Friday afternoon from uh, another potential buyer um, who's very interested and wants to arrange a time to come out and see the property. In the meantime, I've been in talks with uh, Century 21 Hancock Properties, the real estate agents that we use for our other two um, sales, and they have agreed um, to come down to a net 6% uh, commission for being the agent, which the board hey, would like she, to She should, down. and as a former school board member, mm -hmm. and she goes to my church, there's no way we're gonna, she's going to extort. 10% of us. I, I'm glad to hear she that. She gave us an 8% break on the other property. Yeah, but she said the price break. Down. An 8% break. <laughs> break. <laughs> so, uh, nice break. So any questions for Dr. Winborn over Joe Tolley? Just to clarify, and I apologize, I haven't read it. Is that 10% um, of the offer they bring in? I mean, 6% or 6% of the final Net 6% to them. So if there is a buyer agent, then we would need to build that into the cost of the, of the price as well. So, and, I, and maybe she didn't address this, but, you know, like as with the last time, there's the offer she brought in, and then there's the bid. Yeah. But she's talking about the final sale price. Yeah, the final okay. sale price. So, 
So the now buyer agent. Now, bring in at least one of the subsequent bidders. I mean, I right. don't mean this is what you did. Right. So the buyer agent comes in, and they want their 6%. I mean, typically they split in a, in a, in a, in a residential home, it's a 6% commission, and if it's the selling agent happens to be the buyer agent too, they get the full six. If not, they get three and three. So you're talking now we're given six plus? That's, that's what she proposed. Is, is that standard for commercial? That seems yeah, high. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Originally she had done eight for the last properties, and so we asked Dr. Wimborn to negotiate that. The buyer had a, an agent, and he didn't pay that person. Correct. So presumably that. So she, the, what you're going to end up, this may be helpful for you to review. She, she sent me her proposal in writing so, and forwarded it on so you to look at it. Okay. But it, it was a concession mm -hmm. in her mind that she was giving us a 2% less because they, they mm -hmm. said they feel like they can sell this property. And that bothers me. That that bothers me. That could that could end up being ten percent, depending on what the, the buyer's agent has negotiated and wants. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did we not give you the ability to negotiate that? Does it need to come back to us? Is this for information or us acting on it? Based on your previous direction, it was for information. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions about solar? The the low ball offer I was out of town for some time. That did that ever materialize or come back? Did they counter? Did they come back with a no sir. And the original person who wanted to put the truck storage and all that, they are no longer interested? Well no, he's not no longer interested. I think he's waiting for a bid to be accepted. Oh he's waiting to do the little game to him. <laughs> and so what was encouraging to me is that the other call that I got on Friday, which seemed like a serious inquiry, it was a local person. Hmm. Okay. Good. Good. All right. Graham will send you a high. Yeah. So I'll probably defer to Ms. Dubson about most of this, but basically this is the conclusion of our lawsuit. Um, oh, so we able to put this behind us, and I believe there's a letter. Or paperwork. This is yeah, and this is just for information. Um, you knew that the lawsuit had been dismissed because we reached a settlement. The um, New Atlantic asked for a letter confirming that the matter was resolved, essentially that they could show to others who, if they had concerns about that there had been a lawsuit. And so we drafted this just confirming that the repair has been done. Um, and that and, and New Atlantic is the general. This is not the subcontractor that we had the overall problem with. So, um, so this is just the information to let you know if this is out there. But um, the repairs are done and have been holding through some serious storms. So that's good. So yeah. was this drafted in November? How would you know you asked for that to date on that letter? I do not know. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It was. Um, I was just saying, if it's something that was recently done, it's had the wrong date on yeah. it. Yeah. I, I do not remember. That may be when they requested it. Okay. So no action needed on that. Is that correct? Okay. Any further questions about that board? Okay. We'll move on to policy 5030, community use of facilities. This is a first read. And uh, Dr. Winborn, you want to speak to that? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. So this uh, policy... Um, that exists, 5030 has a, a pretty strong framework in place for how we make decisions about um, renting our facilities. But um, the recent request that came up, we felt like maybe there was some additional room for tightening it up or, or maybe providing the board more leeway in deciding who and who could not rent something in case it was there was an objection or something. So this language was pulled from, uh, I believe, Wake County or Orange County, but I did a couple of research and Ms. Dubison took a look at it. So. And this still, as I advised, you know, and, and will continue to advise, does not permit you to choose or deny, accept or deny applications based on the viewpoint of the groups who are requesting it. Um, 
but certainly it does allow you to look at safe use of a school property in those tactics. Do you have anything you'd like to add? So uh, this is brought to you as a first read, and we will put together a committee that will review this uh, to bring back further action to you. So there's no action required tonight. All right. Uh, at this time, at 8.30, we will entertain a motion to take a 10-minute break and go into closed session. Mr. Chair, before we do that, I, I would think it would be nice to recognize after tomorrow another new board member. And we're delighted, Ms. Anderson, you're here, and we're glad that you will stay. Ms. Poor Anderson, thing, poor nope. thing sitting back there all by herself. <laughs> It's a little late now. No, don't, don't pull out. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. All right. So we'll entertain a motion to go into closed session. I'd like to make a motion, <coughs> a motion to adjourn to closed session in accordance with North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11-A6, 143-318-11-A3, 143-318-11-A5 and section 115C-321 for personnel and attorney-client privilege. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you did it first and now you said it first and second. second. All right. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, we'll take a 10-minute Okay, board members, we're back in open session, and I would like to take a motion to approve the certified personnel as approved with the exception of the assistant principal at Creemore Elementary. Motion. Second. Okay. We have a motion by Dr. Houlihan and a second by Mr. Juby. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, now we will take the motion to approve the assignment of the assistant principal at Creemore Elementary. So moved. Second. All right, so a motion by Dr. Houlihan, a second by uh, Mr. Uby. And Mr. Dr. you might you have any recusing yourself? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Classified uh, personnel exhibits as presented. Second. Second. All right. So a motion by Ms. Allred, a second by Mr. Uby to approve classified personnel. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? There you are. <clears throat> You'll look at your agenda. You have some dates to remember. Um, again, I, I realize there are a lot of board activities going on this month. Um, try to be what you be as much as you can there. Um, we will be represented at Celebration, thanks to Farrington and Smith, on Thursday the 12th. Uh, we have our work session. Again, if you can come prepared for that, we want to talk about training, board procedures, and then the mid-year conversation uh, for the superintendent's evaluation. Uh, then the 23rd, we'll be, be hosting a couple districts and business leaders, commissioners here at Central Office for the Direction of Public Education. We will be working with our county commissioners on the 30th at Thornton Library. And then you also see, um, we have both the dates for the walkthrough. Mm -hmm. yep. Before you see the dates, can you just have one on March 17th oh, and okay. one on April 1st. Okay. So March 17th and April 1st, those schedules have come out. So if you can come to some of them or, or however, uh, it's important for you to be in the schools to see what's going on with academic being, or performance being our focus. March 17th, we're going to begin in the northern end. We're going to begin on the northern end of the district. Okay. Is there anything, Madam Superintendent, you want to add? No, I'm just excited. The ball game tomorrow night, I need to say, for um, South Glamping, right before we came in here, and I'll send you something later tonight if you get the answer. Okay. <coughs> Do you have it? I'll try to mind. I'll tell you the same thing.
circuit, the commission and the Supreme Court wouldn't have stayed until their hands were dry between the parties here. Very true. So what was the problem? The problem is South Brandsburg's size of the GM. Not big enough. It is our smallest GM, but when you get this far in sales, you want to run quarters faster. Sure do. And so they've been advocating and fighting for that. However, the team traveling to us really wanted their fans to be able to get in as well. So they must, according to the High Sales Credit Association guidelines, get at least a third of the ticket. So the gym seats about 600, so they get 200 pre-sale. And South Bramble pre-sold 200. That leaves about 200 at the door. So we had to submit a plan today for overflow. Or we had to submit a plan to move it to a larger gym. Now that didn't quite go over as well because Bramble Central was trying to travel with their team and support their team. But they were certainly more than willing to help out if need be. So right now it sounds like the plan is to stay at South Bramble. I want you all to go out for them if you can. I want them to be there quiet. But then we're hoping the final game will be Saturday. Hmm. Saturday. Semi-final. 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 Saturday at Carolina? That's what I'm hearing. Yes. I think it was ECU. ECU and then Carolina. So we may have some traveling to do, but we want to we want to cheer our teams on if if they get seven three tomorrow. <coughs> seven. 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 Uh, what's, what's I'll find it out. Yeah. Okay, we'll pull it up for us. They're doing a dynamic job. And, and where is Bramble Central traveling? North Church Point. North. So if you want to take a little trip, a little field trip tomorrow, Bramble Central. They're traveling as well. We got one of the best high school principals I've ever seen. Really? Yeah, Isn't that nice? I don't care what you tell me, I'm going to make you work hard for it. Dad is about it. Forever. You can hear it. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <coughs> Some good things happening. Thank you all for your support and your work tonight. We've got a lot of practice. Excuse me, I don't want to seem like a dummy here, but I can't find the dates to remember. There, there, there's no attachment on our. Just click on the link. To see yeah, the number fourteen. Just click on it. Yes. Just mm -hmm. click and see the one right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Go back up there. Who knows what it is? I, I can't get into high school. Mm -hmm. But I was being one of the. I guess I am a dummy. No, 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 no. So the 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 question I had, I was too, so busy trying to find the date. I missed what you said about the seventeenth. The walkthrough. Yes, instructional walk, <laughs> March seventeenth. We will do our work that, that day. We start at 9 a.m. And I'll send you a schedule, but we will be in the north. We'll be in the northern part of the county. And then again, we have April 1st for our second round of instructional work. And it looks like that's all the dates we have. Anything else? No, this is the adjournment. Right, sir. We have a motion by Dr. Houlihan and a second by Mr. Yeeti to adjourn at 9.28. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right. Thank you. Good night. Have a good Very evening. Very good, David. You did a good job.